Well, good morning, everyone, and may I welcome everyone to the 13th Public Petitions Committee meeting 2015. I would remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system. Uh, no apologies have been received. Uh, the first item today is consideration of a continued petition, and that's in consideration as PE1458 by Peter Cherby on a register of interest for members of the Scotland Judiciary. As previously agreed, we are taking evidence today from the Judicial Complaints Reviewer and members have a note by the clerk and a submission from the petitioner. And they've sent a link to the previous Judicial Complaints Reviewer's annual report. And can I welcome Gillian Thompson, OBE, uh, the, the, the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, to the meeting. I now invite Ms Thompson to make a short opening statement, uh, no more than five minutes, and uh, after which we will move to questions. So. Over to you, John. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to say a very few words just to put today in context as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've been in post since September 2014. Uh, I have a background in public service, was a civil servant for 36 years, and since then uh, I've gathered to myself uh, a, a, a group of uh, board memberships on charities, third sectors, and now the Judicial Complaints Reviewer. Um, just by way of where I'm at at the moment in terms of the work, since that was something that you asked the, my predecessor, um, since I took up post, I've had 22 requests for review uh, to date. So as of today, I have 17 outstanding from that 22. Um, I'm actively looking at three this week, so hopefully we'll get rid of those um, by Friday. I did inherit a backlog of 14 from my predecessor. I cleared those uh, around the 25th of March 2015. So it just gives you a bit of a, uh, a feel for how the work is going generally. Um, the waiting time, if you like, for people is around four to five months. But I haven't had any complaints about that, although I appreciate that it's not ideal. Uh, I wrote to the committee at their request on the 12th of January. I'm supportive of a register uh, of interests, uh, always have been, and that remains my, my position today. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, in a letter to the committee, you wrote, we live in an age which transparency about interests and activities of those in the public eye is regarded as good practice. Uh, there is a perception that anything less is the result to attempt to hide things. This would seem to suggest that anything less than a degree of openness associated with a register of interest would not constitute best practice and would be perceived as, as an attempt to hide things. Uh, would this be a fair interpretation? Absolutely, yes. Yes, that remains my view. David. Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning. In morning. your opening statement there, you said you were in favour of a register of interests. Can you expand that in a wee bit, um, why you're in favour of it? Uh, well, for the reasons that I set out in my letter in January, um, I think that uh, people who are, who are in public service, uh, I might go further and say particularly, you know, people who are paid, if you like, by the public pound. Uh, I, I don't see that there is a reasonable argument to be made against providing information, you know, within, within reason, uh, about other activities. Um, people in this room, including myself, have keep a register of interests. Uh, it's not particularly onerous in my experience. Of course, you know, we would be talking potentially about there being a register somewhere and someone would have to keep it and all those points I made in my letter. However, you know, if one thinks about it on a reasonably regular basis, they need to be updated. I will be updating my register shortly because of taking on some new and some different responsibilities so but but it is simply it for me it's about a mindset it's it's I can't see arguments against I have to confess I find that 
rather difficult. Um, so, so if you would like me to give a balanced view, I'm not sure on this occasion, although I, I'm experienced in giving a balanced view, I'm not sure on this occasion that I can do that. Um, I think that uh, in particular, in the environment about which we're talking about in the context of this petition, um, people want to be able to feel that they are getting, um, they are getting an even-handed response at court, if you like. Whoever is sitting there in judgment, um, you know, there's no bias, there's you know, all of those things. And I think a register would go part way, I mean, it's all part and parcel of a wider picture, to reassure people that there was nobody's hiding anything. Thank you. Jackson. Good morning. Hello. Um, do you consider yourself part of the establishment? <laughs> uh, well, I suppose that depends on where you're sitting, really. Uh I uh, ask No, it, probably no. not. No, no. no, no. I don't. Well, I, 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 I don't know if I'm relieved or not. It's just that, <laughs> as far as I can see, the establishment, insofar as it exists, has been unanimously against uh, any such, as has the government. No doubt the personage of, uh, of Mr McCaskill, who was the government at the time that we received <laughs> the advice, but he will speak for himself in due course. Um, our difficulty throughout all of this is, obviously, your predecessor was quite sympathetic. Yes. And, uh, from what we've read, that that you have you have been too, um, the former Lord President, um, whose principal argument it seemed to me to be that unlike members of this Parliament who have the opportunity to answer back, uh, members of the judiciary would not have that opportunity if challenged in some way. Ironically, however, he deigned not to come before the committee to answer back in person to any of his assertions on these matters. So we've always had to sort of try and read the runes or I think privately our former convener and deputy convener were able to meet him, but they are no longer here. Um, his argument was that I think essentially that A, there was no need uh, in this era of transparency for light to shine on the judiciary, um, but that potentially some great malfeasance of justice would occur if it were so to do, but primarily that they had this obstacle to being able to redress any assertions that were made based on the register as it would exist and any claims that might be made of it. Does that resonate with you as, as sufficient grounds to disbar such a suggestion? Uh, no. Um, my my understanding of what of what he had said before was that, as far as he was concerned, Lord Gill was concerned. Um, judges took an oath to uphold, you know, certain values and so on and so forth, and therefore, you know, anything further than that wasn't required because public was able then to rely upon uh, people in that position, knowing what they needed to do and doing it as it were. Now, my understanding is that um, uh, since the Judicial Complaints Review post was put in place in 2011, there is now a, uh, a recusal process. Judges can recuse themselves. There is a register or a list, at least, as I understand it, uh, of, of those people who have done. Um, but I, I'm not persuaded by that argument, no. I, I, well, people at the moment are able to make a complaint about the conduct of uh, of, of a judge in what, whatever form, um, and I would have thought that potentially uh, some way of challenging or answering back or having a review taken of there is a list and you know, whoever is making the complaint. I don't know. I mean, I can see that there might be a need to extend the, the complaints process, perhaps. I don't know. But, um, a, a, you know, it, it, is, it is a normal part of public service. People keep a register. It's not... It's just common sense. For me, anyway, it's common sense. Okay, thank you. 
Can I? I see the logic in where you come from. Can I just ask, though, who would you see as imposing a sanction in the event of a breach or failure? Would that be back to the Lord President or would it be to yourself? Who would be the final arbiter of a failure to register or a failure to properly register? Well, uh, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing, isn't mm. it? I mean, as the judicial complaints reviewer role stands, mm. uh, it does what it says on the tin in terms of the regulations. Mm. All I can do at this current juncture is to examine whether or not the rules have been followed in terms of the complaint. I don't look any further mm. beyond that at all. I think that uh, it, there would need to be consideration, obviously, as to how the process would work, but um, the, the Lord President currently has responsibility uh, for sanctioning judges in the event that something is found against them in terms of their conduct under the rules, and I would have thought that that would sit you know, squarely on the shoulders of whoever comes along as the Lord President in future. And presumably the register would be uh, financial and pecuniary because a lot of the recusals that are made at the moment will be on the knowledge of a witness or a yes. relationship to Yes, a... yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a register of interests, isn't it? Mm. I gave you my, my little register of interests, including mm. what I'm paid and, you know, what I, who I support by way of charities and including my membership of the Scottish Daxent Club, just really to underscore that, you know, it's, um, it, yes, so, so the answer to that is yes. Whatever de is deemed appropriate for others, such as yourself, uh, and, you know, government ministers and so on and so forth, um, why should it not be deemed appropriate for people who are sitting in judgment of others? John Wilson. Yeah, good morning, Ms. Thompson. Morning. At the present moment, the, we have seen the establishment of a voluntary register of recusal, and we just want to try and get that issue over. That at the present moment, for a judge or a sheriff to recuse themselves is done voluntarily. Uh, and could you confirm that is the case? Uh, I, 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 as far as I'm aware, that's the case. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just a, in terms of public register. Uh, we have just seen the establishment of a new private bank, the first private bank that's been established for 150 years, claims to have 250 shareholders. Now, it's been reported in some of the press that some of these shareholders are judges and sheriffs. Uh, would you think it would be appropriate for those judges or sheriffs to actually register if they were shareholders in a, a private bank? Well, uh, why would they not? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just raising it as a as a question. Uh, it's not something I've thought about in terms of coming here, but I'm looking at it from a point of view that uh, if there is anything at all uh, that could be construed by a person in the street using everyday common sense, that something could get in the way or might be perceived to get in the way, then I think that should, go, uh, that should go on a register. But we need to remember that's not for me to, um, to make those kind of decisions, even should we ever come to that position. Yep. The reason why my understanding you've been invited along today, Ms Thompson, is to give us your views, uh, because we respect the role of uh, Judicial Complaints Reviewer, and we took evidence from your predecessor yep. uh, in pursuance of this petition and it is to try and hopefully uh, indicate to the committee where we can take this petition and the kind of issues that are being raised. And you did say that the ordinary person, or to paraphrase you, the ordinary person in the street should get to know whether or not a judge or a sheriff has interests that may impact upon their serving or hearing a case in front of them. Uh, how far, in your view, would you want to be, see, see that be taken? Because there's issues about uh, financial interests, there's issues about uh, people appearing in front of them who may be members of the same golf club or same society as them. You've, you've made reference to your Dutch Hound Society membership. Uh, so how far would you want to see that register going in relation, if there was a register established, 
uh, in terms of sheriffs and judges uh, register of interest? Uh, well, I, I think that, as, as I'm on record already at saying, I mean, and, uh, you know, at the outset I said that I'd, I'm supportive of my predecessor's position, uh, I think that uh, there should be a register, judges should have a register, and on it they should note their interests. Okay, now, um, would we ever get to a position where in a court somebody would say, oh, well, I, I just want to register this is the judge speaking, I want to register the fact that I know this person or I'm in the same golf club or I don't know this, you know, I, d I don't know. I mean, in the context of us having this conversation today, I don't know. Um, that would be, that would be, it would be necessary to have a bit more thought about the practicalities of all that. All I can say is that from my own point of view, when I go to a meeting, we have a point at the beginning of the meeting where we, we, we are asked, for example, whether there has been any change uh, to, to the register of interest that we keep in a particular context. Uh, but I think, you know, it's not for um, what I'm saying, I'm just, perhaps just to clarify again, is that I am supportive of there being a register of interests. I think that is what public wants to see, I would say, if people have thought about it, uh, what that looks like in its absolute finality. Uh, I might have be asked for my opinion, uh, but, you know, as we sit here today, I'm not sure that I can go all, into all the ins and outs of exactly what that would look like. I appreciate that, Ms. Okay. Thompson. Thank you very much for your evidence. Angus. Thanks. Good morning, Ms. Uh, Ms. Thompson. Good morning. Um, just following on from, from that point, um, there's, there's an argument that the information on a register could be abused by uh, the media, uh, hostile individuals or in, indeed uh, dissatisfied litigants. litigants. Um, is there, do you have any view on that argument? Uh, well, uh, it is, it is in a, an inevitability in my personal experience that um, when you put information out uh, into the public um, that uh, different interests might cross over. Uh, I have had personal experience of that really just very recently. And, um, and uh, so there was an issue that I had to deal with in relation to what looked like some sort of cross-purposing of some different roles that I hold, uh, but that was just a, you know, a misunderstanding on the part of the person who was seeking to investigate a bit further, and one has to spend a bit of time, in my experience, on scrambling some of that, but I'm not sure that I would necessarily say that that's a reason for not doing it. Okay, thank you. I should have said litigant. These, things need to be, these things need to be managed. Of course they need to be managed, as I've indicated in my, in my response in January. I mean, you know, somebody would need to hold the register. It would need to be managed. Of course, there's an on cost in relation to all of that. But I think, as I'm understanding the nature of the petition, it's about seeking some clarity for those people who are, uh, who are going to court in terms of interests that, that judges may, may hold that are not known. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I've got the floor, convener. Can I uh, go back to an, an earlier point that was raised? Um, you, you indicated uh, that um, you, you agree with your, your predecessor's view um, that uh, the powers of the JCR to review the, the complaints uh, process are, are actually quite quite limited. Um, if, if that is the case, and you agree with uh, with, with your predecessor. Do you have any plans to, re to review the complaints process? Uh, it's not for me to review. No. Uh, I have okay. said to Scottish Government that I think that um, we're four years into the role uh, and the role is now held by the second person in the role. Um, and so the time, as far as I'm concerned, sitting here, it probably would be time to start thinking about uh, the possibility of reviewing whether or not um, what was originally envisaged um, under the, the primary legislation, which was passed in 2008, is what is 
still required. So I'm supportive, as always, as a, an old civil servant in terms of, you know, we have a piece of legislation, there's a policy, there's a concept. We have something that the Parliament agrees to. It's in force for a while, and then at some point or another, and a three, three or four-year period seems to me not unreasonable, um, to go back and have a look and see whether or not it's still meeting its requirements. And um, I would say that, um, I mean, I'm sitting in the role, but, you know, a review might say, maybe we don't need one. Maybe we don't need a JCR. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there's lots of different ways to look at this. Uh, and I wouldn't be putting my hand up saying, oh, we absolutely have to have. What I'm, what I'm interested in is this, bluntly, is this value for money. You know, is the public getting value for money at the moment? I think that, generally speaking, well, I'm hopeful that I'm giving value for money. I'm getting more efficient at doing the, the, the reviews and so on and so forth, and the speed will come and so on and so forth. However, uh, it is a question as to, it is a very narrow rule only looking at whether the rules have been followed. That's it not looking at anything else over and above that, the whys, the wherefores, the how could that possibly, is that reasonable, none of that. I may have thoughts, but that's not my role. So a review, yes, not for me to do, however. Input, yes, but that's for someone else to carry out, should they decide that there's scope and appetite and it fits in with all the other work that needs to be done. But, well, presumably it will be a, a, a priority that you will raise with the new Lord President once he or she is appointed. I, I, I will, as I have already raised it with, with Scottish Government, my contacts in Scottish Government, including uh, Mr Wheelhouse, who I met in January. OK, thank you. Zola. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just wondered, uh, you made a comment about it's taking you perhaps four to five months to deal with and yeah. individual cases. And you yourself have suggested that perhaps that's a little long. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> it's without saying that I would then ask, what do you think would be a reasonable time? And do you think you'll be able to meet that in the near future in terms of reducing the time that it's taking you just now? Well, I know you'd, you'd not end for very long, so I appreciate that. Yeah. that, that I'm, I'm asking you to set yourself almost yeah. a challenge. And, okay. uh, well, I've already done that, mm -hmm. and um, uh, as, as, as you may be aware, uh, the contract with the JCR and Scottish Government is for up to three days a month, and um, I have been working more days than that sure. by agreement with Scottish Government. So, for example, from the middle of Mar uh, December, uh, I was, I've been working four days a month. And uh, because the backlog just refuses to go down, uh, largely because of input, you know, and, and so on. And, of course, I've got its demand-led. So a demand-led service on a restricted number of days is always going to be uh, a bit of a headache for the person who's delivering the service and for the people who are waiting. So I ha did put a proposal to Scottish Government a, um, in May, I think it was, and they've come back and agreed that, and I'm, so I'm doing six days this month, next month, and August now. Uh, will I clear the backlog? No. I will get through it. Uh, I can, for, with two days... Um, two days extra over and above the four, so effectively twice as many as the contract says, I should be able to push through uh, enough cases to get to, ooh, I would like to say exactly how many, uh, but, and it depends on the complexity, of course, because some are very straightforward, and you can see some require me to give a bit more thought, maybe to seek some clarification, and so on and so forth, and then everybody is entitled that I spend a bit of time thinking about what I'm going to say. Um, I mean, it's the second in the role. I've been able to pick up 
um, the, the, the processes that Moy put in place. Um, do they need reviewing? Yes, they probably do, but I don't have time. Um, so, so my hope is that by the end of August, I will have substantially moved through the backlog. I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, I have a background in public service, specifically in frontline service. So I think it's a long time for people to wait four to five months. Although, of course, I write to them, I keep them up to date um, uh, about you know how much longer they can expect to wait and things like that. Um, so I'm not sure. Today, I don't think I want to put a figure on it other than to say that uh, I'm moving through the cases more quickly now. I think they take about a day, day and a half maybe, um, to do a case, which is reasonably complex. I could do two cases in one day if it was pretty straightforward and there wasn't much paperwork to look at. Do, do you see what I mean? So... Um, I would like to get to a position where there was no backlog and I was dealing with things as they came in, but frankly, I think that's, uh, that's unlikely. Uh, in addition to the 22 cases that have come into me since the 1st of September, I've also had seven inquiries um, and I've put a telephone number on the website, which wasn't, there wasn't one before, so I get telephone inquiries as well. Uh, so, and then, of course, there's events like today and other things and other meetings and things like that, which which I do in days when I'm not working, if you follow me. Well, do you know, it's, it's, uh, it has to be realistic about these sure, things. Sure, allow me to follow, follow up. I, I genuinely appreciate your response. It's, it's very honest and very balanced. Um, however, I, I don't think it actually helps you, uh, what you're telling me. Uh, it suggests that there's more pressure on, on what you, you're trying to achieve. Um, at the risk of, um, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you, your work would be diluted, but it certainly puts a, a lot of pressure on you to try and get through the cases for the times that you are doing it. And I, I would perhaps suggest that you may want to explore the possibility of um, either getting yourself more help or even more days to try and achieve the, the good goals that perhaps you yourself would like to see set. So I wish you good luck with that. Well, thank you. And if there was to be a review, I think that would need to be part and parcel of the review, bearing in mind that I, I remain in the position of, I, don't, I do it, I do everything. Yeah. So, so things like the housekeeping and the website and that sort of thing, which mm -hmm. really do need attention, mm -hmm. are things that um, I dream about at night. <laughs> They're not keeping me awake, but yes. you know what I mean. Yes, I do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Thompson, in an earlier response to Angus MacDonald, you said that you didn't think it was your responsibility to, to do a review of the rules. Uh, do you believe then that the current rules uh, are fit for purpose? Uh, we're talking here about my role as opposed to the rules, because the rules belong to the Judicial Office well, for okay, Scotland. Then. Do you believe then that the uh, <clears throat> do you believe then that the complaints process run by the judicial office of Scotland is fit for purpose? Uh, it is fit for the purpose that is currently in place. <laughs> um, I might expand on that by saying that uh, I'm in absolutely no doubt that the process that is in place at the Judicial Office for Scotland has improved, um, did improve during the time that my predecessor was in post. And uh, I think when she left, she felt that she hadn't, she hadn't added the sort of value that she would have wished to. But picking up where she left off uh, and having had a number of conversations, meetings with the Judicial Office for Scotland um, I'm satisfied that the process has grown organically and improved and the way in which they deal with the throughput and so forth and the, and the letters that they write and so on it has improved. So as we would hope, complaints process equals service improvements at the entity that is, you know, the complaints are, are looking at. Uh, the new rules were 
came into effect on the 1st of April 2015. Uh, I think they're, they're an improvement, a bit of sequencing, rules following, you know, streamlining, a bit more uh, explan explanation to people who are trying to find their way through the systems. The guidance leaflet was, was improved. So that's one question. The other question is, do I think that the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, I think that, I'm, in, I'm interpreting your question now, yeah. uh, is the JCR fit for purpose? Uh, as it's currently constituted, it does what the regulation, what, what is required of the JCR. Is, uh, could it do more? Well, yes, it could, but that would require somebody to say, we need more. Uh, because it is very, it is very one-dimensional, as I've said. Okay, then, as you, as you rightly said, the new rule, the new complaints rules were published on April first. Yes. How far then do you think they went to address uh, the, the concerns highlighted by your predecessor? Uh, well, um, in small measure, I think. Um, Moy had undertaken, I don't know whether you're aware, so forgive me if I'm telling you something you know, but she had undertaken uh, a mini consultation amongst the people that she had, who, who had, um, who had made, uh, who'd asked for a review, and so that she sent that out. So when there was a consultation done by the Judicial Office for Scotland, Moy also did her own consultation, and then she passed all of that up and sent that to the Judicial Office. And uh, a you may have seen that the Judicial Office, in tandem with publishing the rules, also published the consultation, a consultation response, uh, which set out you know, the things they had taken on, the things they hadn't. Uh, so I suppose in answer to your question is that in some part, um, I think they did go a little way to, um, to, to responding to some of the concerns that she had expressed about the rules and the way in which the rules work. Some of that was around the understanding of the person who is coming up against the rules because, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult for people who are inexperienced to properly understand what, what the different rules have mean. Um, so I was also asked for my view, because there was quite a bit of time went by and uh, offered some what I hoped were helpful suggestions. Um, but the Judicial Office, well not but, but and, the Judicial Office took a view obviously in the totality of the, uh, of the responses they got. And, um, and, and made a determination that the Lord President was able to agree doesn't really answer your question, I know. So, in part, in part, I don't know whether you've seen, I don't know if the committee might be interested in having a look at the response document that was issued by the Judicial Office for Scotland, if you haven't seen it. It is quite helpful in understanding the changes that were made to the, to the rules. Okay. Any further questions? John? Just, uh, just Ms. Thompson, to clarify, could you remind us how many responses... Uh, there were made to the review that was carried out? To the... To the Judicial Office's review uh, uh, held under the Lord President. I'm not sure that I know. Um, I have a piece of paper with me which I can look up and leave, but... Uh, no, it's just that what we have in front of us is information to say there was five responses. Oh, yes. Well, I, it was a very small handful. Yes. yes. It wasn't like masses of numbers. Yep. And I know that you can, you know, construe your own view on that. Well, although I should just clarify that, I did go back to the Judicial Office and ask whether or not they'd taken into account the responses that my predecessor had in terms of that, but they, I, th I seem to remember being told that they had not, so that was, taken a response from... That was going to be a follow-up my... question, Ms. Johnson, <laughs> whether your predecessor's responses had been included in those five. Uh, uh, as one. As one. Yes. Yeah. Thank I believe you. so. Yes. Is there any further questions? <clears throat> Could the committee now decide what action it wishes to take in its petitions? Views to the members? Well, 
be writing to the incoming Lord President, uh, asking him what his view is, given the clear expressions, not just now of one judicial complaint reviewer, but two, and see whether the new Lord President, whoever he or she may be, may be otherwise minded. Uh, I think we're probably incumbent to wait and see what they say before we consider it further, but asking the new Lord President, equally given the view of uh, the from Ms Thompson, it does seem to me that it might be worthwhile asking the Scottish Government whether this is an opportune moment to review the office of JCR, given her comments, and that would be a matter dealt with by them, not by the Lord President, but it seems to me that there's a possibility of perhaps a new regime uh, at uh, the judiciary with the new Lord President, and equally, after four years and into the second judicial complaints reviewer, is the job what we want it, or should it be reviewed? It doesn't have to be a lengthy consideration or review, but is it doing what we want? And if the role is to expand, perhaps dependent upon the Lord President, how much further should it go if there's a judicial you know, register? Jackson. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Convener. I return to the fact that when this petition first came before us, I was actually deeply sceptical of it and became more persuaded that it may have merit in response to the reaction we had to it and to the inquiries that we made. I, I support what Mr McCaskill said. I, I wonder whether um, the attitude of the incoming president to uh, subsequent to giving us his view, uh, offering himself to the committee to allow us to examine that, whether that will be the same as his predecessor, but I think it might be worth inquiring. But I think first we need to see what he has to say. Um, but I, the principal reason I think that his predecessor um, felt that it wouldn't be appropriate was that he didn't see why, how in office it would be incumbent upon him to do that. And I wonder now that he's not in office, whether he would be willing to uh, come before the committee to allow us to understand further the perspective that he took. I was always open to persuasion on this issue. It's been the lack of an argument which seems to sustain itself in a reasonable fashion that has led me to remain to be sympathetic to the aims of the petition. The clerk to the committee has advised me that it's in fact not competent for this committee to initiate a bill of our own. Um, of course, it's open to any member of the parliament to do that in, and to do that in this session of parliament or in the next. But there does seem, as I think uh, Ms Thompson has said, uh, and which is evidence outside of here, a clear public interest in this issue, which has found expression. And in the absence of a more substantive argument than um, the impression that it's not something we want, in inverted commas, I really think this committee should be reluctant to allow the petition to run into the sand, but should do all we can to sustain it and to pursue its objectives for as long as we feel able to do so. So I would support the suggestions made, but add just the additional offer, thoughts as well. John Morrison. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I suggest that we were, if we're writing to the Scottish Government to seek their views, could we get clarification on the further evidence that's been provided by the petitioner regarding the legal advice that the Scottish Government saw? I know that there is a and we have copies of the correspondence the petitioner received saying that the, uh, the Scottish Government feel at the present moment it is not uh, advisable to release the legal advice. But could I ask if we seek clarification about when that legal advice was sought and why they felt it necessary to seek that advice? Uh, because I think there is an issue here in terms of you know, while we might not get the legal advice as it's such, they have admitted in the correspondence that legal advice was sought, and I would like clarification on when they did seek that uh, and the reasons why they sought that legal advice. Okay. MD else? Do members therefore agree on the action that, 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 that's been promoted? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Can I thank Ms Thompson, sorry, before you leave, can I thank you for attending and uh, we'll now suspend for a couple of minutes for a changeover.
This is consideration of PE 1563 by Doreen Goldie on behalf of Avonbridge and Stanburn Community Council on sewage sludge spreading. Today we will take evidence from the Scottish Environment, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency in Scottish Water. Members have a note by the clerk and the uh, submissions. Can I welcome Mark Aitken and Chris Daly from SEPA and Mark Williams and Brian Duff from Scottish Water uh, to the meeting. As both SEPA and Scottish Water have provided detailed written submissions to the committee, I will move straight to questions. Questions, colleagues? David. Um, thank you, Vin Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. The petitioners called for um, sludge spreading on land to be stopped. Can I get your views on that? And what are the implications if more sludge has got to go for landfill or for in to be incinerated? If, um, SIPA's position on the, on, the, on the call for a ban. So SIPA, SIPA wouldn't support the call for a ban. There's a place for sludge application to land, both uh, agricultural land and non-agricultural land. It's a valuable resource, and we need to be treating our waste as a resource. It's uh, a, a useful uh, addition in terms of nutrients and to soil structure and so on. It has many benefits. Um, that has to be balanced. Clearly, there's been an unacceptable impact on communities around, uh, around the country. Um, so we have to balance that and make sure that that, that resource is used, um, used well and it's regulated well. Um, in terms of the alternative uses, um, in terms of landfill, that's not a sustainable option. Uh, we need to be moving away from that idea that if we have a, a waste that is a resource, that we don't just stick it in a hole in the ground. That's, that's the old way of doing things. Um, plus, there's a, an, it would be enormous cost to the public purse in terms of landfill tax, and um, landfilling that type of waste causes its own problems in terms of odours and leachates and so on that still have to be managed. Um, incineration is an option, has a place. Um, a third of Scotland's sludge is incinerated at the moment. Um, there's potential for that to, to increase in terms of a, there's, there's capacity there, or seems to be capacity there. Uh, but there's obviously a, an energy cost and a, a financial cost associated with doing that. And again, it, it, it is a loss of resource as well. Yeah. Um, I think from a, a Scottish water perspective, um, sludge recycling to land is a safe and sustainable practice provided it's carried out in accordance with uh, the rules, the guidance, the regulations, and also the non-statutory controls that we allude to in our submission. Um, and I think as a, as a practice, um, you know, it's obviously well established around the world and, and over many decades as a, a, as a, a resource for, for nutrients and soil stabilization. Um, I think the key issue for us is, uh, is to look again at the, the controls to ensure that uh, we satisfy ourselves, that we're meeting the expectations of the, the environment and also for, for communities across Scotland. So. I think there's some areas in there that, um, between Scottish Water and SEPA and within the wider government review where we can sort of identify um, some, some practices that we can, we can do differently. But I think we need to also set the context that sludge to land is, um, um, is actually one of the minority waste streams in this, in this space as well. So there's a much bigger question out there around how we manage these resources. From a Scottish Water perspective, it clearly remains part of our um, strategy for sludge management going forward. Uh, we do actually... Um, send some sludge for recovery via uh, waste to energy uh, incineration. These are primarily um, through uh, things like cement manufacture and uh, these sorts of kilns. We don't have a dedicated facility for such a, an outlet within Scotland, so they, it would have some fairly big implications for Scottish water in terms of how we need to think differently around sludge were that not to be an option for us. Scottish Water is responsible for most of the sewage plants in Scotland. Uh, can you explain the process of how sludge comes to be applied to the land once it's produced as a sewage plant and what charges are paid in this process and to whom? Um, yes, yeah, certainly the, um, uh, in terms of the operational practices that we would go through, I'll pass on to my colleague uh, uh, Brian Duff for, for going through that one. Um, but yes, we, we obviously operate, uh, we are the... Um, uh, the National Water, uh, Wastewater Service Provider, and um, we have some pri private finance PFI schemes in place, but they are accountable to Scottish Water in terms of how those are run. So, in terms of the end-to-end -end process for sludge horizons and, and recycling, I'll, I'll maybe pass on to Brian just now. Yeah. The main process we go through for, um, well, we treat the, treat the sludge on site, and thereafter we've got a three-stage process. One is identifying um, f suitable farmland, um, liaising with the farmers, doing soil analysis, um, once we've accepted the soil um, um, can be spread on, 
we then have a look at the cropping details, the sludge analysis, to make sure the application rates are suitable for the nutrient levels, um, taking into considering metal levels um, and pH. Once that's um, been accepted and agreed, we then go on to the application stage. The application can be two ways, um, straight out to the field and incorporated, or we would use stockpiles. So we stockpile in a corner of the field, waiting for the next crop to come round, um, and then we apply when the, the crops require. So that's the sort of process we go through. Okay. And what charges are paid in this process? There's no, no charges. No charges? No. Okay. Uh, when we say that Scottish Water is responsible for most of the sewage plants, what other operators are out there? How many? What's the kind of percentage-wise in relation to other operators? Um, the other operators, we've got the PFI operators. They do approximately 80% of our sludge. Um, so that's the, the, so the larger um, cities in Scotland are all operated PFI. But we still have that duty of care to make sure that it's recycled um, properly. Um, after that, there's a few smaller um, businesses out there that do know sort of private septic tank emptying. So they will deal with their own sludge their own way. Um, but as the Scottish Water do the, the highest percentage. Can you maybe advise the committee what information is available about how much and where sludge is applied to, to land in Scotland? Um, yeah, certainly in terms of agricultural land, there's the annual register uh, that gets lodged with SEPA. Uh, so this is a matter of public record in terms of, uh, in terms of that practice. That identifies down to the individual fields and the tonnages uh, and the, also the analysis of the, 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 the chemicals within that, that material as well. Um, so that sits on the public register as uh, the annual sludge register for um, for the regulatory regulatory controls in that in that space. Um, and Scottish Water has a duty to produce that by the end of uh, end of March in every every year for the preceding year. And perhaps just to clarify, the register would also include the private finance initiative schemes in addition to Scottish Water. We would require the PFIs to supply us with that data. The the, the additional um, data that, that would be held is in relation to sludge use on non-agricultural land, which, which would be separately collected and under waste management licensing exemption regulations. David, you have a supplementary here? Um, you're saying about a register of where um, the sludge is spread. Can I ask, how many complaints do Scottish Water and SEPA get from local communities, and how quickly do you respond to them? Um, I mean, from a complaints perspective for Scottish Water, I mean, obviously the, we're aware of the, the recent issues in certain parts of Scotland around the, around the central belt. Uh, in terms of numbers of complaints, um, I couldn't give you an exact answer just now, but um, I know that there's been certain complaints in association primarily with stockpiles. Um, and I'm aware of several uh, complaints in, with SEPA that SEPA brought to Scottish Water's attention uh, in, recent, uh, in, in recent months, but I'm not aware of an actual number. I don't know if SEPA will... I don't, I don't have a total number, but to give a flavour of some of, the, some of the big incidents, if you like, associated with sewage sludge that we've experienced over the last 18 months to two years, one of the, the, the bigger of those was in Erskine last year in 2014, around the time of the Commonwealth Games. So in terms of the storage of that stockpile, uh, SEPA received over 200 complaints in relation to that, that stockpile. That was an example of an, an, an appropriate storage location close to, to houses, a uh, housing estate. Uh, when the material was spread, there was upwards of uh, 200 complaints again um, in relation to the, the spreading activity and the odour generated from, from that. So that gives a flavour of that as being a, a particularly big incident. Angus. Um, I would have thought that uh, you would have come to this committee today with the uh, figures um, with regard to the total amount of, of complaints that, that you had received. Um, <clears throat> now, like... Uh, my colleague uh, David Torrance, um, I, I do have a constituency interest given uh, that, that the, the issue has been uh, ongoing and has been plaguing residents in part of my constituency for, for a number of years. Uh, and I think the fact that the petition originates in my constituency highlights uh, the seriousness of the, the issue in Falkirk East. However, um, the, the redirection of sewage sludge that's already taken place um, away from Falkirk District by, by Scottish Water is uh, welcomed by local residents. Uh, and the ongoing sludge review 
uh, and the implementation of the Regulatory Reform Bill, which uh, we will see shortly, will, uh, I'm sure, uh, see improved uh, regulatory controls. Now, clearly, uh, some operators uh, flout and abuse the current uh, regulations. Um, and clearly, uh, there's maybe an argument in the future for a fit and proper person test um, to look at whether some of these operators should, in fact, be operating. Um, can I ask Scottish Water, as the, the, the supplier, uh, what checks do you undertake um, that sludge is stored and uh, uh, applied in accordance uh, to the regulations? And, and do you take into account the effect on local communities uh, of storing and spreading sludge? Yeah, the, um, the storing of sludge in the stockpiles, um, we undertake risk assessments. Um, contractor does it provides us for the um, the evidence, and we go out and um, do um, checks to make sure it's being done properly. Um, but also taking into effect, you know, the local communities. So we've, we've got people on the ground, and we're, we're actually adding to that number to make sure we're um, checking every stockpile that we go out there now. Um, the, the checks we do in contractors is the normal procurement checks to make sure they are, you know, fit and proper to carry out the, the role. They have the um, trained staff available um, and also the equipment and the background in, in doing that. So that's all done at the procur procurement stage. When you say you do checks on whether they're fit and proper, there is no formal fit and proper test, though, is there? No, as, as yet? You know, we, will be do, we will do a technical um, evaluation of our contractors to make sure they're capable of undertaking um, the role um, and to making sure that they have um, adequate trained staff. Okay, I mean, that's clearly something that uh, perhaps the government can look at in future with regard yep. to uh, any new legislation that might, might be coming forward. With, with regard to uh, SEPA, um, what role um, do you have in inspecting the, the storage and application of, of sludge? And what steps do, do, do both Scottish Water and SEPA take uh, if you do discover a problem? In terms of the role that SEPA has under the current, the current regulatory framework, um, in terms of spreading to agricultural land, SEPA's role there is really about the collection of information, the, the register, uh, assessing the register. Um, any nuisance that arises from that agricultural spreading falls to the local authority under general statutory nuisance provisions, so SEPA doesn't have any legal powers there. Um, in terms of storage of sludge prior to either agricultural or, or non-agricultural spreading, in terms of, like, for example, land restoration projects, former open cast sites and so on, um, SEPA regulates that under uh, waste management licensing controls. All the law requires at the moment is a notification to SEPA, um, so there's no assessment of whether the storage location is appropriate or not, and that's not required in the regulations. There's no minimum distance specified from receptors, so in terms of being in the front foot in some of these storage locations and, and, the, and the law being set up to... To, to assist us and protect communities at work. Um, it, it, it's not in the place it perhaps should be at the moment. In terms of um, sludge application to non-agricultural land, as in the case of these uh, land restoration projects, SEPA will assess those. Um, the law requires an application to, to SEPA, which we assess to determine application rates and so on. We inspect those sites. Um, we also respond to complaints when we receive complaints um, and we can do extra compliance work. So, for example, in Seapits East Region, which ranges from the, the borders up to, up to Dundee and Angus, we took a, undertook a project an initiative last year where we assessed um, all storage locations to assess whether they were appropriate and also whether they were within the six-month timescale that's required by law. And if we found that they were breaching those rules, we had the, the exemptions removed or the, the stockpiles moved. And that was in collaboration with Scottish Water, that, that initiative. Um, in terms of the other enforcement options that are available to us, we can... We can remove a waste management exemption, which is the authorisation, the, the licence, if you like, that allows the, the sludge storage or the application to take place. Um, there's a minimum period of 21 days for that to take effect. Similarly, we can serve an enforcement notice to require waste stockpiles to be removed. Again, a minimum period of 21 days. Clearly, if you're a community that's being impacted by odour, that 21-day that period is, is too long. Okay, thanks. Um, so how many inspections have been un undertaken in the last 12 months? Uh, and how many have resulted in enforcement action um, in the last 12 months? Okay, I, I don't have those figures in front of me. Uh, see, uh, again, I would have thought you sh should have had these figures with you today. Yeah. 
I can give a flavour of the, the type of uh, enforcement action we have taken. So we have removed exemptions, we have served enforcement notices to require removal of stockpiles right across Scotland. Um, I, don't have a num I don't have those specific numbers. Well, can, I could you, can you send these to the committee? Yes, it could indeed. Yeah. Uh, although I am disappointed that you don't have them in front of us today. Um, th there is an added complication with regard to the, the mobile licences that are issued mm. uh, by SEPA. I mean, clearly these are being abused by a number of operators. I mean, that's my opinion, I have to say. <laughs> um, is there, are there any future plans to clamp down on, on, on mobile operators? Because clearly, you know, they're just continually applying for, for mobile licences and they're, they're, they're being uh, granted because there's no, no, no way around it. Um, is, is there, is there some, some way to stop this happening? So you mentioned before your, yourself, Angus, the um, uh, regulatory reform process that's a partnership between Scottish Government and SEPA. So part of that, that process is a, a new permissioning framework, which will really rebalance the, um, the way we licence not only organic waste to land, but, um, but other waste management activities as well. So at the moment, what we could, and there's a, there's a range of options out there, the, the Act's in place and provides a framework, the detailed proposals and the secondary legislation is, is to come. Um, but there's a, a range of options there. So we could, as you, as you talked about earlier, for for those contractors that involve in sludge application, we could require them to be licensed. That license would require a, a fit and proper person assessment. Um, for example, at the moment, if a sludge contractor has a poor compliance record in one area and an exemption has been removed, for example, SEPA can take account of that when uh, assessing an application for a, a future, a future um, sludge usage by that same contractor. So the fit and proper person would allow that as part of the application process. Um, also, we could require that mobile plant licences could only be used for very specific activities, which I think the legislation originally intended, which was around on-site and in-situ uh, remediation of contaminated land, and not for some of these activities which are more odorous, like the lime treatment of sewage sludge, which I think has been a problem in your own constituency. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, clearly, um, we, we have to ensure that the secondary legislation is as robust as possible, and the sooner it's in place, the better. Thank you. Azar, do you have a supplementary? Yeah, just, uh, Chair, um, good morning, gentlemen. And I also am a little surprised you don't have actual figures with you today, because I thought that was why you're here. However, you, you, you made one comment about, you know, contractors and how you would, um, they, they move on. The other, the other issue I find sometimes in the building trade as well is contractors actually change names, and they can still be there. And uh, is there any way of policing that at all? Or do you have a mechanism of policing that at all? Yes, that could be challenging under the current regulatory framework. So it could be a, an associated company with the same individuals, but a different company name. Um, there is, again, the, the detailed proposals aren't on the table, but there is scope to, to have the fit and per proper person take account of associated persons, um, so which could in, could in part at least address some of those, those issues. Yeah. Yes, because um, I, I would have thought it was quite easy for people to just simply change name. Uh, and continue the mild practice that they would do. Uh, so accountability is actually quite important and, in fact, vital. Yes. So um, I would really like to see some proposals from you chaps in the very near future. Yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kinsia. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Just to go on to some of the issues that have been raised by the petition, and that's the, the health issues and the impact on the environment and particularly the wildlife. I read with interest in terms of SEPA submission uh, that most of the work that's been done in terms of research relies on uh, research that was done by the European Commission 10 years ago and desktop studies that were done uh, seven years ago. Uh, given that we have what is an increasing green belt growth in terms of housing uh, and the you know, proximity to uh, human habitats uh, in relation to some of the work that used to go on before. Uh, is that having an impact, do you think, on the, the residents that are in these houses uh, and the, what they fear may be the contamination that's taking place by the spreading of sludge, either on agricultural land or, in particular, non-agricultural land, given there's less regulation in terms of non-agricultural land? The work that, that we reviewed, as you've rightfully pointed out, was carried out a, 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 you know, a large, you know, 10 years ago, which um, 
I think that there's a need for some follow-up work, taking into account the new measures and practices uh, we've seen in the place. I should say that, that the work, which generally uh, didn't find any implications for human health, was, was based on the caveat that these measures were, were carried out um, in, in full accordance with current regulations and, and guidance. That, 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 that was these particular studies. However, your, your main point is right that practices in, in Scotland have, have been changing and um, I'd certainly, certainly um, you know, recognise the need for uh, looking uh, more, more carefully about the, the impact, particularly the, the effect of um, odour nuisances on, on, uh, on communities nearby and, and clearly communities have uh, suffered uh, from that. Is it not also true that in the last 10 years we've actually, the science has moved forward and we're actually identifying more contaminants in the sludge materials that are being used because of the eating habits and other habits of the population where the sludge is actually emanating from? Uh, that we are becoming more knowledgeable in terms of what is it. You no, know, we get figures here, you no know, 99.999 multiplier in terms of the contaminants. But clearly when we the science gets better and we know what materials are actually going and being passed through the sludge uh, and the impact that that's having on the soil and, and, and I make the point once again in the non-agricultural sector uh, what can we do to actually make sure that the monitoring is taking place at an appropriate level that we're not just spreading more contaminants on the soil or spreading airborne contaminants yes. uh, for the populations surrounding the areas where the sludge has been disposed. Um, I think maybe from a, a general Scottish water perspective, um, the quality of sludge over um, the last few decades has been improving um, largely because of uh, earlier European directives on dangerous substances and everything else. It has meant that we've had more upfront controls on what comes into our wastewater treatment works to start with. Um, so in terms of contaminants, the sludge is, uh, I would say, um, cleaner, if that's the right phrase. Uh, than it has been in the past in terms of the, the metals and the other the things that may be within there. Clearly, from an agricultural perspective, that's very well tightly controlled uh, around all of that. Um, and I'll probably suggest that um, we do you know, keep under review the, the other issues that go on there. And, and uh, in terms of the sludge land review that's going on presently, uh, I think looking at these wider controls, uh, we're very happy to, to, to be involved in that discussion and to, to see where we need to go next in that. Also referring to SEPA submission, there's a paragraph which says, here in a quote in the paragraph, SEPA do not have regulatory powers to control odour in all circumstances, such as on agriculture, spreading on agricultural land. Who does have the regulatory powers? If SEPA doesn't have regulatory powers over this area, then who would a concerned citizen go to uh, to get action taken? Uh, if it's not SEPA, because I've heard this before from uh, constituents where they've went to SEPA and I've done it myself, uh, and the standard response from SEPA is, oh, well, that's not within our regulatory powers, you need to go and speak to somebody else. Who would they speak to in these circumstances? So that would be the local authority, and it's usually the Environmental Health Department. Uh, so it falls to statutory. Where there's not a specific power in law, for SEPA as a regulator to control the odour, which there's not in the case of agricultural spreading. It's false to general statutory nuisance provisions under EPA 90, which the local authority are responsible for. Given the review that's currently taking place that we've been referred to, and the Scottish Government, Scottish Water and SEPA are involved in, has there been any discussions in the review discussions regarding additional powers for either Scottish Water or SEPA in relation to control? Because one of the concerns I have is uh, when you go to an environmental health department, the environmental health department will pass you to SEPA. When you go to SEPA, SEPA will pass you to the environmental health department. And then the, the, usually the standard response for the environmental health department is, we don't have the resources to examine this, SEPA do. Uh, so how do we resolve this continuing circle that people get put into uh, in relation to making sure that action is taken when appropriate? Uh, and while I'm on the action as appropriate, do you think 21 days is sufficient for a notice period to actually be issued uh, and for action to be instituted by someone who's found to be in breach of the regulations? Yeah. 
And your, I'll last, answer your last point first around the 21-day period. So that's a period that's specified in law, so that's yeah. a minimum, minimum period before the notice can take effect. So to answer that question simply, as I said earlier, no, I don't, I don't think that's quick enough. I think that's far too long. Um, in terms of the here and now and liaison with local authorities, I'm aware of the picture you, you paint, and that certainly don't, that's not the position we like to find uh, the public in, where they're being handed from one authority to the other. We do try to work collaboratively with local authority um, environmental health departments. We've got a good relationship with the, the Falkirk Council Department, for example. Can, uh, can I just clarify, is that with the Falkirk Council Department, now that the residents in Avonbridge and Stanburn have actually raised the issues and have basically pulled SEPA into that debate because of the issues that were being faced with the residents? No, I don't think so. I, I have knowledge of that Falkirk area. I used to be the unit manager in that, that geographic area, so I know the I know that, that situation quite well. Um, we've also got examples of, of, uh, of joint working with the Ayrshire Councils and Renfrewshire Council and uh, SEPA's West region. That's where we are now. We try to do, is, we try to do the best job we can there in, in terms of that, that, that good communication and interaction. Um, going forward, I think SEPA would support the, uh, support the proposal that the sludge use and agriculture regulations, which you've talked about, and the waste management licensing regulations that apply to non-agricultural land are all incorporated within a single regulatory framework. I think that would be better for everybody, for the public, for SEPA as a regulator, if we were to have responsibility for that. Um, so I would fully support that. Uh, for, for, if I may, just from a Scottish water perspective, um, I think it's in all our interest to have confidence in this, 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 this regime. So certainly in the conversation we've been having with, with SEPA and with the, the Scottish Government, we've been looking at the extent to which um, the the way in which sludge is managed and recycled under the current regulations, the visibility to SEPA of the activity is part of that process because it needs to be looked at in context with other materials and other activities on land um, that may have a, a, a consequent impact on, on, on odour and, and, and other things that are going on there. So certainly from a Scottish water perspective, the statutory controls and having more overarching visibility of that one to give more confidence would be good. But the other thing to probably sort of flag up here, particularly for um, sludge and agriculture, is the water industry uh, and Scottish Water has been particularly concerned to ensure that we have set out clear codes of practice uh, that go beyond the statutory minimum that, that, that are required here. So we certainly would sort of look to maybe sort of pull that sort of uh, um, uh, scheme within there, the, the assurance schemes around biosolids that are currently out there. Because at the end of the day, the whole thing has to kind of rest on the public confidence in, in the activity. So that's, that's, where, that's where we're certainly very open to that, to that, that conversation. And I think that's what the petitioner is trying to do, is get public confidence in the yeah. system that currently operates. And clearly, public confidence is lacking in terms of the issues that have been raised by the petitioner and other communities, as other members have indicated. Because can I seek clarification uh, from Scottish Water, from you, Mr Williams or Mr Duff, in relation to the reference to PFI mm -hmm. uh, operators Within, under Scottish Water, can I just kind of clarify, because the, the reference in the SEPA paper actually talks about uh, generally Scottish Water and PFI operators or their contractors. Can I just get clarification how many PFI operators operate in the sector and how many contractors? Because once you start moving down uh, the different from PFI operators to contractors, then going down the chain <coughs> surely becomes more difficult to regulate uh, who's doing what and who's monitoring uh, because they talk about in the, the paper six monthly monitoring of the sludge that's being produced uh, are you confident that the PFI contractors and, uh, and the other contractors are actually monitoring as is sufficient in relation to the material that's being produced in terms of the, uh, I think the 11 PFI concessions sit around Scotland right now um, they've all been very much involved within the Basel Assurance Schemes and working at the same levels of, uh, of assurance that we expect or are expected of Scottish Water within this. They're all uh, adhering to the common industry practice around there. In terms of the actual practicalities and the management of the sludge recycling there, I mean, Brian, you, you probably know more about the, the contractual yeah. arrangements there. The contractors across Scotland, there's three main contractors that recycle sludge, both for Scottish Water <coughs> and for the PFI schemes. Um, the PFI schemes do their own um, checks on their contractors and their own monitoring. Uh, but because of all these issues, Scottish Water are taking a, um, a front foot in that, and they're actually doing their own audits on the PFI and the PFI contractors, just so we have a better, um, better view of how well they're operating. But just to, just 
for further clarification, the PS, PFI operators are operating on behalf of Scottish Water, I understand. Yes. Yeah, so they're, they're actually, Scottish Water has subcontracted that work to PFI contractors. Uh, yes, in terms yeah. of the PFI concession, they provide the facilities and they operate the, operate the plant. Just one final point, convener, and it goes back to that point Angus MacDonald made about some information uh, that would have been useful uh, for the committee today, and that's to compare the incidents that have been reported in the last year and historic incidents of, or reporting incidents in this area, uh, because it would be useful given the, the comment that was made earlier about the, we've seen, you know, it's only recently we seem to have had a growth in the number of incidents. It would be useful to see if there is a, uh, some indication uh, to support or debunk my earlier comment that the growth of Greenbelt has meant that more communities are coming into closer contact with the spreading of uh, you know, this, this waste material uh, within communities. And it's just to try and see if we are seeing a, an increase, substantial increase in the reporting or is it, and what the issues around that substantial increase may be. Thank you. No further questions. Jackson. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, my sons, when they were very young, used to have an expression during the spreading seasons of these things when they would turn on a straight face and look at me and say, it's not very Disney, uh, which I think we can prob probably all empathise with. But I understand the, uh, the benefits as you've articulated them. What I'd like to get is some understanding of our relative use. Um, you talk in the paper that you submitted in relation to 2014-15 of six tonnes per hectare being the average in Scotland and uh, with different um, averages across different uses. And then in relation to Europe, um, there seems to be a variable practice. Uh, you cite a number of countries where two thirds uh, was used as a fertiliser, but of course two thirds of what? Uh, because what it doesn't do is give me any relative understanding of how much across the European Union is produced uh, and then across the land mass of each of these countries, how much is then applied as an average. If that were to be calculated as a table, where would Scotland sit? We can certainly prepare that information for you. It is uh, available and we extracted and summarised that from a table. Um, currently, I'm afraid I, I don't have it, but we can certainly supply that. Uh, do you the, have an idea in your own mind as to whether we would be near the top of that table or somewhere else on it? In terms of the percentage of material applied to, to agricultural land, we would be not, not quite at the top, perhaps about one third of the way towards the top. Countries like um, England, uh, France, Spain would be higher than as we'd have a higher percentage of sludge. And of course, the, the, you know, reflecting population, of course, they produce higher quantities of, of sludge. But as does well. that equal a higher tonnage per hectare? It, it does. It is far, far uh, higher in, in, for example, England and France, both in right. terms of the percentage of the total and in terms well, of the tons uh, I would applied. be grateful if, that, if, a, if a table of that nature could be uh, produced because it, it would give a better impression to me at least of where we sit and I, I wonder is that an evolving position or is that a consistent position? Toward a perspective I would, I would kind of echo the view that we are roughly um, we're not near the top, we're kind of middling to slightly above average uh, at the European level in terms of the proportion recycled to land. Um, across Europe, uh, when we've looked at this uh, and looked at the trends and looked at the emergent uh, strategy in other European countries, it's very much led by availability of land bank and appropriateness of, uh, of use in the land in these areas. So certainly some uh, European countries, the Netherlands and so on, have, have much less opportunity to uh, recycle to land. So. The key thing about the sludge use and agricultural regulations and uh, our part in this practice is to ensure that we are typing the sludge to the appropriate soils so that we're not presenting that risk. So it's very much going to be detected by the topography and the, the, the land holdings across European countries. So it will be a move-in feast uh, uh, over time. New technologies may come onto the market which will allow us to do something a little bit differently. Um, at the moment, as, as, as you've heard, we, we're using that around about a third of Scotland's sludge goes down to, to energy recovery because that's an appropriate thing for us to do using the cement manufacturing uh, facilities available. Uh, and I think the key thing for us in Scotland is that we retain 
um, several options so that we're not stuck with one outlet. No, no, I, I, I can sympathise with that. I, I, I guess it's just whether there is, I would want to know whether there is a, an, an evolving trend yeah. elsewhere in Europe that is moving towards new technologies yeah. potentially faster than we are and that we are relying upon this uh, in consequence our position on the league table may change because others are improving their performance or uh, the tech use of new technologies. And I would just quite like to understand that because I'm sympathetic to the underlying argument, but I'm maybe less sympathetic if we are relying upon that uh, statistic without necessarily uh, demonstrating that we, you know, that we aren't falling out of step with practice elsewhere. Thank you. Yes, supplementary. Thanks, Convener. Just picking up on, on Jackson Carlos' uh, point there, given that we are looking at comparisons in, in other countries, um, you, you mentioned in Scotland that uh, uh, a third is going to incineration or energy uh, recovery. Now, I've actually done some research uh, into the practice in Sweden, um, where 50 per cent is going to uh, incineration at the moment. Um, now, it, it, open air disposal in Sweden has uh, become less popular um, ever since they slapped a 250 Swedish kroner per ton a sludge tax um, on open air uh, uh, spreading. So I'd be keen to hear your uh, professional opinions. I mean, clearly it's a matter for, for government, but I'd be, here, I'd be keen to hear your, your uh, professional opinion on whether or not uh, a sludge tax would perhaps help to concentrate mines in Scotland? Um, I, I suppose as a policy principle, um, you know, the waste hierarchy we have in Scotland, driven by Zero Waste Scotland, is, is very much uh, presuming against not reusing the resource in some, some way. I think a sludge tax for applying sludge as a recyclable product would, uh, would, would, would present some, some fairly significant challenges because at this point in time, uh, the, I suppose the benefit uh, in, in straight nutrient terms, uh, et cetera, it, it, I can't remember the exact figures, it's, it's, uh, it's best part of 150 to 200 pounds per hectare, I think as a nutrient value uh, for, 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 the, uh, uh, for, for, for the cropping regimes that are, are coming onto that land. Um, taxing that further would probably um, drive down the sustainability of that practice, I would suggest. Uh, so uh, that's without sort of having thought much further about that one, my, my initial reaction would be, it would certainly be a big challenge to maintain uh, a recycling outlet with that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? If there's no any further questions, could I ask the members what action they would like to take in this petition? Mr. Convener, I'd quite like to be in receipt of the additional information that we've sought that, uh, during the evidence session this morning before we take any further view, if, if colleagues agree with that. Angus? Yes, I think we should also seek the views of the petitioner um, before we um, decide any further action. Um, clearly, uh, the, the, um, in the public gallery today, so it would be good to hear back from them at some point um, uh, before we make a final decision. John Wilson. Convener, I, 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 like Jackson and Carlo, I think we need to get the further evidence that we've been uh, we've requested today from SEPA and Scottish Water. Uh, and when we further consider it, hopefully the petitioner will respond to some of the comments that I've made by Scottish Water and SEPA. Uh, but I think there, there may be further action at a later date we might want to consider as a committee. Uh, but at the present moment, I'm content to I uh, await the further information requested. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I should have said um, we're also uh, waiting to hear the outcome of the, the review. Um, and should that review require uh, a full consultation, then the matter is going to uh, continue for, for some time, I would imagine. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, as soon as we... Uh, I think the Cabinet Secretary indicated to me in the Chamber that... Uh, um, there is the, the completion of the review is due at the end of the summer. Um, that's a, as uh, specific as he was, but um, clearly uh, we need to await that as well before we take a further decision. Okay. Members, therefore, agree to the action points that have been raised? Thank you. 
Can I thank Mr Duff, Mr Williams, Mr Daly and Mr Aitken for attendance. Now suspend for a couple of minutes for changeover. The next item of business is consideration of PE 1319 by William Smith and Scott Robertson on improving youth football in Scotland. As previously agreed, we are taking evidence from Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. Members have a note uh, and a Commissioner's report. And can I welcome Commissioner Tam Bailey uh, to the meeting? He's accompanied today by Gillian Munro, his information officer. And I invite Mr Bailey to make a short opening statement no more than five minutes, and then we'll move to questions. And could I also uh, welcome uh, MSP Chick Brodie, uh, who has an interest in this petition. Mr Bailey. OK, um, thank you, and thank you for the invite today. Um, I just want to really set the context for the production of the report, which has led to today's hearing. Uh, this is, I believe, the second longest uh, petition that the committee is considering. Uh, um, and I was approached uh, late last year uh, by the previous convener, uh, David Stewart, uh, because evidence had been provided to the committee, I think on two occasions, and lots of written evidence, uh, some of it conflicting. Uh, and in order to uh, provide further information to the committee, I was asked to get the views of children and young people uh, who are affected by or who are involved in youth football. Uh, we, we offered to do two things, and you'll see in the report, we produced what we call a child rights impact assessment, and that was really looking at all of the available information that we had that was in the public domain and making some assessment on whether the practices were, um, had an impact on children's rights. And in fact, Gillian was the, the main uh, author of that. But we also commissioned uh, um, academics from Edinburgh University to engage with children and young people. And they did that through uh, involvement of 28 young people in uh, focus groups and also individual interviews with uh, 19 uh, young people. Uh, so it's been a fairly comprehensive exercise. It did come across some difficult ethical issues because young people who are signed to clubs, they're living their dream and they have to, we have to make sure that they are properly protected if they're going to be making statements or giving us information. So we're delighted to be here today. There's a number of findings which I, I think, well, I'll just basically touch on. I think there's an issue about 10-year-olds signing what they think are contracts and potentially being held to those right through their, their, their formative years. I think there's an issue about 15-year-olds being held to contracts, sometimes against their wishes, for a further two years till they're 17. And I think there are issues in respect of the perception uh, that they're not allowed to play for clubs or the, their behaviour is restricted by the contracts. I would put that in inverted commas because there's quite a bit of debate about whether they're contracts or not. As far as the children are concerned, 
they think they've signed a contract. Uh, and it, it, it impacts on their behaviour because they don't get to play for schools, some occasions, right? not all, uh, um, but uh, there are certainly restrictive practices there. And the last thing I'll say is a positive thing. The young, young people love their football. They really, really love it. Uh, and they would go to the end of the earth to be able to play football, uh, um, which is why we have to make sure that they have been treated in a respectful manner and that we don't in any way abuse their enthusiasm and their uh, aspirations of uh, um, trying to attain that dream of becoming a professional footballer. Thank you, Mr Bailey. And can I thank you for what was a very comprehensive uh, report and it was certainly well received in, in a, a lot of quarters. And, uh, but from that report, what do you think is the key message uh, in the report for Scottish football clubs and organisations? And what is a key recommendation in the report for the committee? OK. Um, uh, the, the, the key finding is that when the system works well, it's when the system is operating well, that's fine. It's good. But it's when it's not working well that you find that the odds are stacked against children and young people. So I alluded to the fact that you can have a 10-year-old who signs a contract. Uh, there's a well-meaning system of compensation for the, for the clubs so that they can expect certain payments depending on how they are graded and the, um, the quality and the expense of the academy that they are providing or the training that they are providing. But if the club who is on the, if, it, if the young person chooses to either try and get out of that contract, then they are, they are sometimes left as a hostage to the original club because there's a dispute over the payment. And this can last for, for quite a period of time. And in theory, you could have them held uh, year on year because the payments haven't been made. So that's one issue. The second one is that for 15-year-olds who sign a contract, and I'll call it a contract, uh, then it's, in, it's at the behest of the club as to whether they're released from that contract at age when they turn 16 and onto their 17th uh, uh, year. Uh, and that's because the rationale is that there's been investment and time, energy and resources put into the development of that young person. Uh, and that sometimes it takes a while for that to blossom. And maybe 15 is at an age where the, you know, it might take an, a, another period of time. And the clubs want to see whether that's the case or not. But the call on that is just the clubs. And the third issue is this business of not being allowed to play for the school. And certainly SFA have tried to rectify that uh, and tried to make clear that uh, that's not a condition that can be built in. But it is still at the discretion of the clubs. And one of the recommendations in it is to, to remove that. So we've got, we've got a number of recommendations. I don't know if you want me to move on to the recommendations right now. Um, but the recommendations are that uh, a young person should have the same period of notice as they would in youth football. In other words, if they want to move clubs, that they can give 28 days notice uh, and that would be the end of it and they can go elsewhere. I, I think that uh, the registration bind on 16, 17 year olds should be removed so that uh, there shouldn't be any difference in terms of the terms that they're signing uh, as a 15 year old as before that. I think that where there are disputes, they have to be resolved uh, expeditiously so that a young person is not held or a child is not being held for a long period of time, not being allowed to either play for another club or move to another club. Uh, and I think there's an issue about when the reimbursements are paid. Uh, this is a, a, a recommendation that's actually buried uh, in the report. But the part of the difficulty in the system just now is that the compensation has to be paid uh, up front, if you like. Whereas we've got so many youngsters in our system uh, that it would be better, I think, more sensible uh, that that compensation kicks in when they actually sign a professional uh, contract with a professional club. I, I do think that there's a need for a complaints process to be built into it. It's not, not there just now. And at the end of the day, there may be a need for regulation and monitoring. But I have to say, I think my preference would be uh, that there's self-regulation, uh, and we may discuss that later, but rather than uh, go for a, 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 you know, opt for what might be quite expensive uh, regulatory uh, framework, if there can be self-regulation, then I think that would always be better uh, than having to have external regulation. 
So that's quite a list of uh, quite a shopping list of uh, calls there. But thanks for the for, for the opportunity to be able to lay that out. Obviously, your your report has been in the public domain now for you know a few weeks, and you know you've just highlighted some of the key recommendations there. Overall, how do you think your uh, conclusions have been received by uh, football organisations and young people? Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I mean, the, pro the purpose of producing the report is to try and shine a light on the issues and stimulate some change, some improvement, because that's what the petition is called, improving uh, youth football in Scotland. I think that the key bodies uh, is the SPFL and the SFA. Uh, and we've sent copies to both those bodies. We weren't asking for comment. We've received uh, uh, acknowledgement from SFA. Uh, but those are the bodies, I think, who have got... It's within their capacity to actually look at... Uh, so how can we improve this system? And many of the recommendations are actually targeted at the government bo governing bodies. Uh, um, it certainly has got some, some, some uh, coverage, and I'm pleased about that. But really, uh, it's not about the publicity on it. It's actually about whether we will change how we deal with our children uh, and whether, and I, I would certainly say that I think the rights have been infringed right now because of some of these restrictions, because of restrictions on what they can do, because of restrictions on their uh, behaviour. And indeed, I don't think that sufficient attention is paid to their education during the time that they're expected to be nurturing the skills in the way that uh, we deal with it. You mentioned there that you've sent copies to the hierarchy. And yeah, we sent copies to SFA and SPFL. Uh, yeah. As I said, SPF, S, SFA have sent back an acknowledgement on it. Uh, um, it's something I might come to about one of the actions that the committee might be interested in, particularly interested in what is the response of our governing bodies, namely SFA and SPFL. And do you think the SFA and the SPFL will accept your recommendations? Or, and, uh, um, or do you think you're going to be facing challenges here? Well, they're not, they're not responding just now. I, mean, I, I, I think, actually, <coughs> one of the actions the committee might consider is to formally write to them, because the petition has come through committee processes, uh, to seek their views as to whether they will implement uh, the recommendations. Uh, you may want to either write to them or you might want to call them. And I know there's been a session where previously they've been called, because I, would, I certainly would, would hope that you seek reassurance that they will be capable of self-regulation, and you can make an assessment on that before we actually follow any recommendation about uh, external regulatory frameworks. Uh, that would be a matter for the government. Uh, uh, but I think the committee would want to satisfy itself as to whether what might be the response of the governing bodies. Uh, and I would suggest if you're not satisfied, then certainly we should be uh, bringing this to the attention of the government. I've already met with the minister. He knows that I'm giving evidence today, and he knows that that, that, that stage uh, that stage in process uh, and I think it's about time we actually saw some end point to the petition uh, and for me the end point is actually improvement for the way that we deal with children and young people uh, who are our talent of the future David Thank you convener and uh, good morning the problems identified with uh, Scottish football clubs and children's rights are they associated to all clubs or as are there good working practices out there among Scottish football? Yeah, I, I mean, I said earlier, when it works well, it's, it works very well. Right? I'd, um, I can't possibly comment on the practice of all of the clubs in Scotland because I, 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 I'm not familiar with them. What I am familiar with, though, is the different star gradings of the, um, the training uh, regimes and the costs. Or, I'm not familiar with the exact cost, but I know that, uh, that some are deemed more expensive and bigger compensation than others. And one of the problems with that system, while it's well-meaning, is actually what you've got is a clutch of clubs uh, uh, who have got the lower star ratings. And those are the clubs where I think that there may be a, a temptation for them to uh, harness and, and include as many young people as possible in their training regimes in the hope that other clubs, or richer, richer clubs, will come and they then get the, the compensation. Uh, if I give you an, do you want me to give you an example? Right? Because yeah. we, we've got some comparisons. So you've got uh, Germany with a population of 82 million who invest over the last uh, 10 years have invested over 500 million euros 
in their academies. So these are these are state of the art academies, and they produce well, they produce world champions. But of a population of 82 million people, they have an under 19s uh, a total of 4,735 children involved in their academies. Scotland, by comparison, has a population of 5 million people. And we've got somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 children and young people involved in our academies. Now, there's something, quite, there's something very significant going on there, that we, as a very small country, have got so many youngsters, and proportionately much, much greater than a, a very successful footballing nation like Germany. I'm, and I, I'm not, I don't think we're in a position to suggest the level of investment that Germany uh, puts into it, but I do think there's something about how they manage to <laughs> nurture the talents of what would be a, much, a much, relatively much smaller proportion of their footballing uh, prowess or their footballing talent, whereas we seem to take a very wide uh, approach. And what we do by doing that is we build in, I think, false hopes for many of our children who are involved in the academy system. They are desperate to be involved in it. They, 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 it's, their, it's, their, it's their dream being realised. And yet we know that the vast majority of them are not going to have that dream realised, just in terms of the numbers. So I think we need to think this through about what, we are, what, what hopes we are falsely, in my opinion, building up in many of our children. Can I ask, um, how do we bring about this attitude change in Scottish football you're seeking in the report? Yeah, I, I, this is part of a much wider issue. Um, I mean, I, my our business is children's rights, uh, and I think uh, a, a, better in, a better and more informed approach on the rights of children uh, will actually assist in all of this. But it's not just in the realms of football. I mean, I could go on. It's, it's in a whole number um, of, of areas. But I think that by following some of the recommendations here, we would start to swing the pendulum back from all of the power being in the hands of the clubs to at least listening to the views and opinions of children and young people, which is one of the key tenets of children's rights in the UNCRC, about a right to have an opinion, to express that opinion, and for due weight to be given to it. And right now, there's absolutely no weight given to it because there's no means of children uh, escaping from some of these, uh, these contracts. All of the odds, as I say, when, it goes, when, 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 it, when it's being challenged are in the hands of the clubs. And that just can't be right. It's so unfair. Thank you. Mr Bailey, you, in your report you also mentioned too that, uh, that you'd like to see an independent regular body set up. Uh, I, I think we said we, we, that, con, that consideration should be given to that. I, I, I think in the first instance, uh, the SFA and the SPFL uh, um, yeah, sh should... I'm, I, I can't direct the committee what to do. I think consideration should be given to uh, their response to this and the, on the premise that we need assurances that unless they actually implement some of these recommendations, then I think we will run the risk of being in breach of children's rights. And at some point, there may be a challenge on that because of the way that we've allowed our children to be treated uh, in, in their pursuit of an aspiration uh, of becoming football players. We can treat them much better and still, I think, get better results. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think there's a. The, the, do you want me to do a, a comparison again with the with, with the German uh, uh, approach? Because one of the one of the laws in Germany, I'm quoting from a document here, which I did have earlier. Yeah, here it is. This is celebrating ten years of the academies in Germany, and one of the comments. This is by a Leverkusen, uh, who are one of the highly regarded Bundesliga uh, academies. And yet, this is them, they're there for, for, for football, and it says, do not neglect school is the law, not just in Leverkusen, but in all the club academies. And changing room boards display which team has achieved the best average results in the last six months and the individual ranking of the best schools. In other words, they pay as much attention to the academic achievement of the children and young people as they do about the nurturing of their talent. And I think you'll be hard-pressed 
in whatever good practice you identify in Scotland for the same care and attention and diligence being given by our clubs to the educational attainment of the children that are on their books. If anything, I think that the clubs, as I, as I characterised, are trying to, in some instances, have as many young people on their books as possible so that they, in the hope that they can then uh, get some investment from the transfer of that, or the, for the compensation on that child and young person. And I would be interested to know whether the SPFL, what attention they pay to the educational attainment of children and young people. If Germany can do it, then we should be able to do it in Scotland. Is there any other questions? Mr Brodie. Yes. Thank you. For, first of all, thank you very much for indulging me in, uh, in attending this session, which um, certainly is close to not just my heart, but to, to others involved. I wonder, uh, good morning, Mr Bailey. Yeah. Um, the comments you've just made about schools are quite important. Why would there be any difference? I mean, I've talked to SDS who say the registration forms aren't worth the paper they're written on, the contracts don't meet legal requirements in terms of payment. So just, I, w I just wonder, coming back to the school thing, why should there be any difference, in your opinion, in football protecting youngsters' rights as opposed to, particularly talking about 15-year-olds, as opposed to modern apprentices in other areas? Where they get, they can join, co-join, education, and exploitation of their talent. Um, well, I, 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 firstly, it doesn't matter whether these contracts aren't worth the paper they're written on or not. The perception of the children and young people involved is that they are contracts, and in fact, they are delighted to be signing up to a club because it's one step closer to that dream of becoming a football player. Uh, and that, that means that we have to build in extra protections because they make themselves vulnerable at that point of signing. And actually, the FPA, uh, the, the, um, yeah, the Professional Footballers Association, they've actually produced a really useful document. And I would make that uh, mandatory that before signing uh, a, a contract, that, in fact, young people are made aware of that because at least it lays out some of the consequences of signing. And, I mean, yeah, drawing a, a, a parallel with uh, uh, modern apprenticeships, sure, youngsters are having their talents uh, nurtured and brought on, but we also have to make sure that they're properly protected, especially if we're talking about signing young people at age 10. And also, parents are very keen in all of this as well. So one of the findings when we spoke to uh, uh, children, or the, the, through the focus groups and individual uh, interviews was the critical importance of the support of the family. And families are often uh, putting themselves, uh, putting a, a, this, a very high level of investment into their child in order for them to make progress in this area. So I don't know if that satisfies yeah, no, the, that's fine. The, is that, is that, I, I have a situation on my desk, in fact, meeting somebody later today whose son is an international player, under 15, um, who's signed under yeah. contract alleged contract to a major Scottish club. And as you say, there are some clubs that are OK, but the SPFL doesn't seem to have any control over the clubs. In fact, it's the other way around. And this particular uh, individual lives in Fife uh, and has to travel often to train with this club in, in, in Glasgow. He is not being allowed to leave that club unless a fairly significant sum is paid to whomsoever he might go. How does that sit with the United Nations Human Rights Commission on Children's Rights? I, I already said that if we create a transfer market for children and young people, uh, then we're treating them, as far as I'm concerned, as commodities, and it's difficult to make decisions in their best interest if there's a price on their head. Uh, and so that's why I, I'd suggested earlier that, in fact, we try and decouple the movement of children amongst clubs from the payment. And one way of doing that is that payment triggers in once the child has actually signed for a professional football club. Uh, I think it needs a bit of careful thought because this, this is all well intentioned. People are trying to make sure that the smaller clubs are compensated when they put uh, time and effort and that there's some incentive to do that. But the impact of it when it doesn't work out in the case 
uh, that you've given us an example of uh, is that the child suffers. That just can't be right. And it can't be good for the development of our football in Scotland uh, to have uh, a young player who may have talent, who's got talent to blossom, somehow being stymied and being held back because of a dispute between two of our clubs. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and I'm not an expert in the inner workings of football, but I do know that that is in controversy, contravention of UNCRC. I have one last question. Um, in the past, some of our great footballers have come up through the boys' club situation, uh, and there are very good boys' clubs. I mean, why? What is the fundamental difference in approach? Is it just because of the money aspect? Or, or yeah, I, I mean, our, our boys' club are part of a vast army of people uh, who, on a voluntary basis, provide amazing input and support to children and young people. Uh, and they're, they're one shining example of people who would do it, whether they're paid or not. In fact, they're not paid. But one of the things, and I, this is a much wider question, is about how you actually get uh, some of the resources and relatively big money to filter down in a way which isn't, uh, that doesn't provide some perverse incentives to the grassroots of our game. Uh, that's a bigger question than I can answer through, through this particular report. But if there was to be a review of the payment system, then I think it would be worth looking at how we resource uh, the lowest level of that in terms of our youth football. Thank you, Gabriel. Is there any further questions? Could I ask the members in what action they would like to take in this petition? Could I then perhaps uh, suggest that we reflect on the evidence heard and consider a paper at a future meeting? Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Can I thank you, Mr Bailey and, and Ms Monroe, for your thank attendance you. here? OK, Much thank you. We'll now suspend for a couple of minutes to change over.
The next item of business is consideration of new petition PE1566 by Mary Hempel and Ian Reid on national service delivery model for wharf and petite patients. Members have a note by the clerk, a space briefing in the petition and submissions, and we have also received a late submission from ACSMA, uh, which is on your desk. Can I welcome petitioners Mary Hempel and Ian Reid to the meeting? They are accompanied by John Fugan. Uh, the Chairman of the Scottish Association for Children with Heart Disorders. Uh, I now invite Ms Hempel to make a short opening speech, uh, no more than five minutes, and uh, we will then move on to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener, and to the Committee for hearing our petition today and our request for the implementation of a national service delivery model of care for patients who self-present to self-test or self-manage their warfarin levels where it is deemed safe and effective to do so by a healthcare provider. This should also include a safe and uninterrupted coordinated infrastructure for patients in paediatric care when moving in transition to adult services who self-test their warfarin levels. I am an adult congenital heart patient. I link many of our diverse, inspiring and growing population in both paediatrics and adulthood. I am on warfarin to thin my blood. I am a wife, a mother, and I am employed and lead a healthy lifestyle after the implantation of two metal heart valves, an aortic root enlargement, and a pacemaker. My biggest fear is having a stroke. After my first open heart surgery, I was carried by my husband to attend my anticoagulation service. My family were advised that the service did not provide home visits. I requested to work with my local care providers to self-test and, if safe and effective to do so, self-manage my anticoagulation levels. I was refused. The explanation was not person-centred, with no one actively listening to my request. It was at the directive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, because I don't work away from home. A few weeks later, I was also refused an urgent appointment at my anticoagulation clinic which an out-of-hours GP requested me to obtain after he prescribed me a course of antibiotics which would increase my anticoagulation levels and which, if not checked, could prove fatal. With our nursing staff and local clinic reduced, I found myself placed in a catch-22 situation. Had I not been fully informed and thus able to challenge my decision, the outcome could have been devastating. My concern is for those patients who would not have questioned that decision. I went on to meet with a haematologist at Gart Naval Hospital who agreed that my time in therapeutic range would improve with self-testing. I would be patient number 31 to do so. I agreed to speak to my GP to provide my test strips on prescription. This was well supported and I was provided my, by my, my machine by our charity as this is not freely available. The next day, I received a call from Gartnaval anticoagulation nurses to advise that the funding had been stopped for self-testing training. I continued to challenge writing many letters to the then Public Health Minister, Michael Matheson, who advised that this decision was of individual health boards, and later, at a parliamentary motion, Mr Matheson commented that warfarin patients in Scotland were much older than the UK average of 65 years. However, I believe that this decision should not be age-appropriate, but person-centred. Finally, I met with the Clinical Manager of Anticoagulation Services, who provided me with a true person-centred approach and support, as did the nurses at my local anticoagulation clinic. Last year, I met with the Chief Executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. This was well received and led to a Nurses' Day, where I was supported by John Fagan, the Chairman of the Scottish Association of Children with Heart Disorders, and another adult congenital heart patient who gave an inspiring insight into her long-term condition and quest to self-test. Standard operating procedures were drawn up for young adults moving from the Royal Hospital for Sick Children to adult services, whose parents and carers are taught to self-test when they are prescribed warfarin in paediatrics. I am pleased to say that this standard procedure is now being utilised, however it is still in its early stages. This will ensure an uninterrupted care pathway for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board patients, not only in our congenital heart community, but also other young adults with other long-term conditions who require warfarin. If this is achievable for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board patients, it should be easily available and accessible across Scotland. In September 2014, I began self-testing. My time in therapeutic range has improved and I am able to take control 
and gain an acceptance of my long-term condition. Self-testing has proved invaluable recently in hospital. And due to multiple open heart surgeries in a short period of time, and where access to my veins is now very difficult, I was able to self-test my own levels safely and effectively. However, there are approximately 80,000 warfarin patients in Scotland, situated within 14 regional health boards. This petition is to request a national service delivery model of care for all warfarin patients who self-present to self-test or self-manage their warfarin levels where it is deemed safe and effective to do so. We wish for them to be given that person-centred care approach in line with the Scottish Government's local delivery plan, the 2020 Vision, which details our vision is that by 2020, everyone is able to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. We have a healthcare system where we have integrated health and social care, a focus on prevention, anticipation and supported self-management. To achieve this, we require a whole system approach, a culture change, where patients work in partnership with their healthcare providers, where they can gain information, communication, education and support, an active and ongoing partnership. The NHS will undoubtedly see positive benefits, while patients' outcomes improve as many patients, parents and carers become more informed, empowered and educated in their own or their child's condition. I refer you to the guidance and evidence notes from SIGN 129 from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh who all support self-testing or self-management. We as patients wish to embrace the key objective of Gone Yourself, the Scottish Government self-management strategy written by patients with long-term conditions for patients with long-term conditions. The strategy was endorsed by the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing now our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. It details that we should learn from people's own experience of living with a long-term condition, working in partnership with the individual, with access to timely and appropriate information and support to enable them to make well-informed decisions about their life. It concludes that life is for living, for living well and not for enduring. The Scottish Government writes fantastic protocol to encourage and support self-management, Yet, for warfarin, warfarin patients, the delivery at ground floor level is difficult with many challenges, challenges and barriers for both patients and healthcare providers. No one should have to fight for care, in particular at a time of ill health and uncertainty. I wish to thank my co-petitioner Ian Reid and to John Fagan, the chairman of the Scottish Association with Heart Disorders, for supporting me today. Thank you also to a patient who gave an inspiring insight into her quest to self-test at a Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board Nurses Day and to patients who have written to their health boards and who wish to be provided with that patient-centred care approach and have been refused or challenged. I wish to thank the committee and to those who have endorsed and supported our petition. Thank you, thank you very much, Mary, for uh, your presentation. And, uh, you yourself have said that you do self-testing. Uh, but can you... Advise me why self-testing and self-management, which has been under discussion for so long, why there's been so little progress made on this? I think there's, quite, there's a lack of education. Um, the anticoagulation nurses are fantastic, but they, they don't have um, maybe the support of our health boards. Um, it, it's not promoted anywhere. Um, and yet, the fact, there, there is factual research to, to show that it does help. Um, People have to have a buy-in because you're, you're taking responsibility for, for partly of your own care. So that's why we were very careful in how we worded the position to say that people need to self-present um, or sh say they wish um, to do that and have the buy-in from patients. Um, I wanted to take control of, of my condition. It was very difficult for me to accept what had happened in such a short period of time. And I was quite determined that I wasn't going to be a victim. I wanted to get back to work. Um, I wanted to, to try and lead as, as much of a normal life as I possibly could. Okay. I note that studies have shown that patients who self-monitored uh, had notably fewer strokes and deaths as results of clots. So to what extent do you think this is a result of a greater understanding of your condition? and the importance of testing and adjusting dosages, you know, for example, following illness, weight change, and, and so on, that has resulted from this being trained in self-management? 
I think initially self-testing is a huge change for patients and if, of course as a patient you're apprehensive because you, you want to ensure that your care is safe that it's effective whilst improving and sustaining your quality of life. It is a huge culture change in the, in the delivery of anticoagulation care. However, if, if we can get the help, support and the clinical guidance, it can prove beneficial, worthwhile and both patient and cost effective. Um, with an ageing population, I think it will also help support patients who really need to see their anticoagulation clinic. If you look at the figures of the amount of people that are anticoagulated in the last five to ten years, it's gone up by 10,000 um, patients from, uh, from South A. Uh, no, for Scotland, the, the figures are... For Scotland, there's approximately 80,000. It was previously 70,000. So how can our clinics sustain that? And that's what I found. I needed a lot of care because my, my medication was changing. I was on antibiotics, and that can increase your anticoagulation levels. Um, and actually, uh, it, you, you work with you, your care providers. I still we email or phone. They're still there if you need them. Um, patients are... are more educated and have an understanding. Um, the paediatric community, our families and carers are already taught to self-test. It's what they do. It's standard um, in paediatric care. So do you believe then that the, 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 there perhaps is a case for all patients and carers to be better informed about, you know, the condition, even if they're not self-managing? Yes, yes. I mean, presently, yeah, I think there is. I think it's, it's maybe not for all patients. But for those who, who want to learn and get engaged and understand and be educated, um, if the support is there, it, it's, it's easily done. Um, when I, it was, initially, it was difficult for me to get someone to listen. And once I did um, and pushed for it, but not everybody would do that. You know, not everybody knows about it. Not everybody would, would push um, to, to try and make it happen. Questions? Anzala? Chair, um, uh, I understand where you're coming from, and I understand the pressures on the health service, but I don't understand why they would not want to support something that you're offering in terms of self-help, because surely that would assist them yeah. in delivering the service that you need. It doesn't make sense to me why they wouldn't want to do that. And uh, once again, I, I think it's all about depart departments within the health service that the costings, the way they, they think about the costings is all wrong, that if, if it doesn't cost one department, the other department is not interested. Yeah. And they, that's where sometimes these things fall through. So, so I'm, I'm very supportive, Chair, that um, we should encourage the health service to actually continue to support um, the ideas that you've presented, because I think they make sense. Yeah. And uh, they're not only sensical in the sense that the patient's well-being is secured, this also means that we get value for money from the health service itself. So it's a win-win, and you're ticking all the right boxes. I don't understand what the issues are. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would very much want to <coughs> find out why they're not wanting to support this. David. Thank you, convener, and good morning. It still is. Um, only 1% of the Wofford users in Scotland um, self-assess, self-monitor, um, which is roughly about 800 out of the 80,000. And you said earlier on that was about promotion and education, but is it because health boards don't want to promote it? They're the obstacle that so few people are actually self-monitoring. Yeah, initially my first letters went out to Michael Matheson because there had been a round table event and that led to Nanette Millen um, having a parliamentary debate on it. And my initial issue was with the comments that had been made. They were very negative and I had, I had sent emails to, to Mr Matheson and, and letters and he came back and said that it was a responsibility of individual health boards but ultimately individual health board accountability are for the Scottish Government so we needed someone there to, not even to change things at that minute. I wouldn't expect anything to be changed on the basis of one person but to listen and if we could you know, one of the, the main issues that we have and we have in any health or social care environment is a transition from child to adult. And I, I was an ordinary patient that could see there was gaps there by speaking to people. And if we were able to achieve that, 
for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board just by speaking to other people, by engaging with other people, then we could achieve a, a lot um, if, if people would listen um, whenever we come forward. I had been through a lot. I would never, ever do anything to make my health worse or promote it for anyone else to make their health worse. If I could commit on that, please. Mary and I attended the meeting with Robert Calderwood and subsequently with Myra Campbell and it was about setting up a standard operating procedure for the care that's offered at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Glasgow and then transition into adult care. And what came out of that was an operating procedure that they use currently but that somewhere in the system when the children move on from paediatric care into adult care they can be lost. Greater Glasgow and Sight and Clyde say that no one is lost in their area. However, when the children move on elsewhere in Scotland, when they're assessed, or not assessed as it may be, but they don't find themselves on self-monitoring anymore. They find themselves that they have to attend anticoagulation clinics. And we're saying that's wrong. That's wrong. Because it's a waste of money, that's for a start. And also the patient is already used to self-monitoring and now they have to go back to clinics. So. And add that when it comes to self-monitoring, I mean, uh, I know that uh, in cases of diabetes, there is also self-monitoring. Um, and, and yourself, of course, you, you've said that patients' uh, quality of life and uh, uh, in terms of their fitness is greatly enhanced because they're self monitoring and I think that, that that in itself is extremely valuable. If you're talking about uh, enhancing the quality of life of people, it's important. But I think also, uh, I, I'm a little puzzled why the health board doesn't see the, the benefit. And the only thing I can think of is that there's those issues somewhere, somewhere which I don't quite understand because if you're, if you're uh, in, in enhancing the quality of life of people, that in itself is value. I put a value to that. So um, I would agree with you very much. I think the factual evidence runs in parallel to the Scottish Government strategy and what they're trying to achieve in self-management and they can ensure that strategy is achieved and it's achieved on a facts-based. Yes. You know, there's facts there to say that it does work for people. Indeed. Indeed. Um, it's just trying to join all these things together. Mm -hmm. Followed by Mr. Carlo. Thank you, convener. Good morning. It's just to you know, comm commend you on your determination to actually get the self-management monitoring system in place for yourself, and the discussions you had for, with Great uh, Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. But could I ask, do you know how many patients in the similar situation to yourself are actually being able to self-monitor and manage in Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board? When, or, sorry, or when I am went to see about it. I went to see a Dr. Mike Leach, a haematologist, and um, he looked at my therapeutic range and he said I would be patient number 31 right. to self-test. So compared to other um, countries, for example, um, in the EU, or if you com in comparison to England, Scotland, um, are, are, the promotion just isn't there. You have to push for the promotion. Can I ask when that, you were given that figure that you'd be patient 31? Yeah, that was probably about um, maybe about a year ago. Right, it's just yeah. I'm trying to what, no, extrapolate from that <coughs> that there's 80,000 yeah. warfarin patients yeah. in Scotland. If you're patient 31 a year ago in terms of being able to self-manage mm -hmm. in Greater Glasgow and Clyde Healthport, which we know has... Uh, a high incidence of heart yeah. issues and, and, and not as bad as some of its neighbouring health boards. Uh, but the issue you said uh, as part of your introduction in response to a question was that when people move out Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board treatment, particularly young people, go back to, for adult treatment to their own health boards, then they are you know, effectively being refused mm -hmm. or denied the opportunity to self-manage and monitor their condition. Do you think there is a, no, the, and I know the reason why you brought this petition forward is to try and get a national standard in place, yeah. but what do you think the reluctance is by other health boards in terms of introducing the self-management monitoring regime for patients? 
I think the, the, um, the machines that we use aren't freely available. So you have to purchase them, and the charities purchase them for the, the children from the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. Um, the test strips, you have to go and speak to your GP and get the buy-in from the GP. You have to go and speak to your anticoagulation clinic and make sure that it's safe, which is right, to make sure it's safe and effective for you to do. So it, it doesn't come easy. Um, there's quite a lot of, of obstacles um, before, before you can make the decision. I personally wouldn't have realised the obstacles until I, I went to myself, if anyone had said to me. Um, I met a few patients through, through the system where I was um, trying to fight, and they too had the same obstacles. It doesn't come easy to patients when they ask to self-test. And I mean, all is, when we met with Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board Chief Executive, it was very well received. Um, they did listen, and it, it, there was a nurses' day, and they were educating their nurses. And, and that's good for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, but there's 14 health boards, and we need to make sure that... My main concern is that this is, if it's safe and effective for people, it's safe and effective and easily accessible for everyone. Um, when you're unwell, you shouldn't have to go and fight and write letters and to try and help people, because your main concern is that you know what happened to you. You don't want it to happen to anyone else. We've got some figures in front of us in terms of the cost of the machines. The average cost is about £400. Yeah. The test strips are about £295, I think, the, the price uh, yeah. that's off a test strip. On average, how often do you think a patient would be testing themselves? On average, if I'm stable, um, I probably test myself once every two to three weeks. However, if my medication yep. changes, um, that, that varies. So everybody probably individually is different. I think initially there would be a high outlay, but long term, the, the cost, what's been found in some of these research and studies that, is that the cost dramatically reduces. You're saying at the present moment that it's the charitable organisations that are providing the machines for children. It is, yes. Uh, so they, they're picking up the cost of that. But the, the issue, does the health board or the NHS pick up the cost for any of the, the, the testing that's done? No, Test like strips. the strips, just the, the strips. strips. Yeah. So, you, so you get your GP will prescribe that that you buy G prescribe. GPs aren't are getting better at it, but there is occasions that we've seen. Uh, yes, we've had occasions where we've had patients come to us and say that their GP won't take the cost of the strips. And I know of one patient who changed her GP because she couldn't talk them round. Right. So the, the, the GPs are a so blocking point. The GP as well. can be a blocking point. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you've got quite a galaxy of people and organisations who've uh, supported your petition this morning. And with my colleague, Danette Milne, and also Richard Lyle, Jackie Bailey, Richard Simpson and Margaret McCulloch, a fairly broad cross-range of cross-party support mm -hmm. within the Parliament too. So it's not actually, I think, individuals that need to be persuaded. It would appear to be the Scottish Government that needs mm -hmm. to be persuaded of the essential request within your petition. Because my understanding is their view is that there's no need for what you're asking for because they say there is already a responsible to have local protocols in place with all of the individual health boards. What I'd quite like to understand is that doesn't tell me very much. Do you know what these protocols are that the uh, health boards are meant to have? Who's responsible for establishing or reviewing them when they were last reviewed? Uh, and whether they are consistent, although I think from what I may have picked up already, they aren't consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, when it says local protocols, is, is that each health board's decision to, to come up with a protocol? Do you know if each health board has and when they last considered it? As far as I'm aware, there is not standard protocol. It's up to each individual health board. Um, and we're also aware that the guidance notes for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence being one was updated in September 2014. So the guidance notes that the Scottish Government referred to, um, we asked to be updated by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. So the actual evidence notes that we have um, are, not, are not updated, they're not clear. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, after the round table discussion that took place in 2013 mm -hmm. and the various motions that were, um, or questions that were advanced by, by colleagues, um, there were a number of recommendations that came out as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, in general, what progress has there been on these? 
none that I'm aware of. Um, right. I probably started looking for self-testing round okay. about that time. That's when I started reading a lot about it. So your petition here today is actually born out of a certain sense of frustration that, that we've gone through quite an extended parliamentary process already, a roundtable discussion, a members' debate, was, a series yeah. of parliamentary questions. Yeah. And so far as you're concerned, we're really not that much further on in terms of there being access on an equal basis across the country. That's actually what you're seeking. So, for want of a better description, a boot up the backside of health boards to come up with a national standard would resolve yeah. the issue just as much as you're having a national service delivery. What you really want is that to be uh, achieved. Yeah, achievable and accessible across Scotland for all patients. If patients come and ask the question, then someone knows where to find the answer. Right. And, and not only to find the answer, but to communicate the answer, because I, I never got that communication. And when I went back and said, why not? And, you know, the Scottish Government um, promotes patient-centred care, person-centred care. It's important that if they say, why not, you understand why not. And if, if they'd have said, for your own benefit, or... And I waited until my INR was stable before I asked. So mm. I, I was quite aware that I wanted everything to be settled before I asked to, to self-test and self-manage um, my own condition. Thank you. John Wilson. Just a supplementary to the question that Jackson Carlow asked. Just for clarification, is it individual health boards, and you're saying Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board have taken a decision to allow this to go ahead. Is it the health board or is it the consultant that the individual sees that is uh, no, allowing people to self-monitor, self-test. Because what we might have, and I'm just looking at the figures you gave us earlier in mm -hmm. terms of patient 31, if you are patient 31, you'll get a badge with that on it. Uh, but in relation to, is that because the consultant you saw decided that you could self-monitor test, or is it a health board policy that every patient who presents and asked to go on to this regime is allowed, afforded that opportunity to do that? I think clinicians are reluctant. Um, they, they require to provide support and education. So, in my opinion, I don't think they're supported by their health board. Um, but as patients, we need to come out and say, we need to give our stories and help people understand the, the challenges that we face. And, mm. and I think maybe if somebody, you know, I eventually did meet with the, the clinical manager of anticoagulation services, yeah. and what a difference that was when you get somebody who wants to listen, it wants to understand and listens to what you've been through and why you want to do it and if it's safe for you and going through your background, it made such a difference and that could have been that difference could have been made in day one. Um, it's, it's just in terms of you no know, issuing guidance, the Scottish Government could issue guidance to health boards, health boards then issue guidance mm -hmm. to the consultants or clinicians and then the clinicians make a clinical decision yeah. as they often do, whether or not that person is uh, uh, suitable Mm -hmm. uh, to self-manage, self-monitor, and it's just trying to get the pers into perspective what that guidance might look at, mm -hmm. look for in relation to the expectations from health boards, but in particular clinicians uh, in their practice with patients. Yeah. Thank you, Camille. Mr. Reid, would you like to say anything? I think Mary said just about everything. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further questions? If there are no further questions. Could I? Ask the committee what action we would like to take in this petition. Jack? Well, I'd very much like to write to the Scottish Government. I'm struck um, by the similarities between this petition and one the, the committee previously considered on the availability of insulin pumps across uh, Scotland, um, where a similar attitude of government um, it really required the minister to intervene to have the various health boards report on the progress they were making in achieving um, their own uh, protocols had to be put in place before anything happened. So I would very much like to know from the Scottish Government um, what their position is in all of this. And I, on the back of that, may wish to recommend that we take evidence from the minister uh, on the issue, uh, because it seems to me all a bit woolly at the moment as to why there is no proper um, emphasis being put on coming up with a consistent position and uh, applying that across Scotland. David? Can we also write to all the health boards um, asking them what they're doing to promote self-monitoring for orphan patients? Yep. 
Convener, I was going to make a similar suggestion, but I'm keen to try and target uh, neighbouring health boards around Greater Glasgow and Clyde who may actually have young patients who are actually being transferred into their care uh, from the, the services of the receiving Greater Glasgow and uh, Clyde to find out uh, what the issues may, may be. And I'm, I'm thinking about Lanarkshire Health Board in particular and maybe uh, Ayrshire Health uh, NHS in relation to how they perceive the difficulties of transferring patients who have been on self-monitoring management regimes moving it back into adult services who are then being denied those services when they go into uh, their own health board. Chair, uh, maybe an, maybe an idea that uh, we also write to the sick children hospitals in Scotland to find out what measures are in place for when they have children leave their area of influence. Uh, do they then pass on the casework? to ensure that that uh, service continues or, or, or do they just simply abandon them? Uh, so that just to find out if there's any uniformity in terms of the follow-up for the treatment that people have volunteered to monitor themselves, I think it's important. Jackson? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on David Torrance's suggestion. I think it would be interesting if we're writing to each health board for, to invite them to clarify to us what their protocol is. Uh, because that may very well illustrate the uh, variability of the level of expectation and service, which might subsequently be something we would discuss with the Minister. Okay. Do you the convener of the board will be able to tell us as well how many people actually self-monitor within their area. Um, so could we ask for these figures as well? Okay. Right. There have been a number of action points that have been raised by members. Uh, <coughs> do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, then. Thank you. Can I thank uh, Mary, Ian and, and John for your attendance? Thank you. Okay. We'll now suspend for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Agenda item five is a consideration of continued petitions and the next item of business is consideration of five con continued petitions. The first petition is PE1537 by Shona Brash on behalf of the Coastal Regeneration Alliance on the proposed energy park at Kikenzie. Uh, can I welcome Ian Gray who has a constituent interest in, in this petition and uh, the members have a note uh, and submissions and uh, Members will, will, will be fully aware of the, the, the background to this petition, but I think by way of background for the public, this petition called for the development plans for Kikenzie to be halted and sought assurances in relation to any future developments. At our last consideration, we noted the announcement that the Scottish Enterprise had dropped its plans, and I'm aware that this has been welcomed by the local community. Assurances have been given with regard to future plans, although I know that the petitioner does not feel that they go far enough. The Community Empowerment Bill was recently agreed by the Parliament and my own view now is that the issue of what might or what might not happen in the future is not one for the committee to uh, at this time. If new proposals do come forward, it may be that our colleagues in the Economy, Energy and Tourist Committee would wish to consider them in due course. In relation to the petition before us today, however, I invite members' views. 
David. Um, convener, I am happy um, to close the petition on the, the grounds that the proposals have now been dropped for a concurrency area. Okay. Mr. Gray. Um, thanks, convener. Um, I, um, and I'm glad that you noted that the petitioner does uh, feel that there are still concerns, certainly, although the community welcomed the dropping of the energy park proposal, which uh, led to the uh, original petition. Uh, there's still concern in the community about what will happen with this site and the degree to which uh, the community's aspirations will be met. Um, however, it is fair to say that um, all of those the committee wrote to following uh, previous consideration uh, have pointed out that uh, a forum has been uh, agreed, uh, a forum that should be established to provide a proper mechanism for dialogue and discussion, and that would involve uh, all those with an interest, including the, um, the, the Coastal Regeneration Alliance, uh, who were the organisation or are the organisation behind uh, the petition. Uh, and I think that um, that progress uh, uh, has been helped and is in, at least in part due to the, uh, the work of the committee in pursuing the petition. So uh, I thank the committee for that. So although uh, concerns remain, uh, I, I think at the very least I can understand why the committee feel that um, they should uh, close, the, close the petition. Angus. I'm sure um, local residents are relieved uh, that plans have been dropped for the energy park. Um, however, it may, be, it may be heading in my direction uh, to my constituency. Um, given that assurances have been uh, given with regard to consultation on future proposals, I, I don't see how the uh, committee can, can take this any further, so I would agree that uh, it should be closed. Okay. Yeah. John? Come here, just... Uh, like David Thomas had remind uh, all the agencies, particularly the Scottish Enterprise, the Community Empowerment Bill was approved by this Parliament last week. When it becomes legislation, as I hope Scottish Enterprise take on board the intent of that legislation uh, and work with the communities involved to ensure that the best uh, delivery of a service and what the community are requesting in terms of their, their campaign is taken on board. Uh, when they go forward, because it, there is a, an issue of concern I have with the letter from Scottish Enterprise, who quite clearly, while they're accepting at the present moment they're not going to go ahead, uh, they clearly seem to have uh, some view on how it should proceed in the future, but hopefully that view won't uh, clash with the community's intentions for that area. Thank you. Is the committee therefore agreed to close the petition? Uh, on the basis that the proposals for the development of the energy park at Kikenzie have been dropped. Everybody agrees? Thank you. Can I thank Mr Gray for attending? The next petition is PE 1542 by Evelyn Mundell on behalf of Ben Mundell and Malcolm and Caroline Smith on human rights for dairy farmers. Members of a note by the clerk. Uh, the letter from the Rural Affairs Climate Change Environment Committee and an email from Mrs. Mundell. Colleagues, this petition is, is uh, as we all remember, is calling the Scottish Government to accept that individual dairy rights have, and have human rights and have been breached by ring fencing rules that apply to milk quotas. And ring fencing was introduced in 1984 and abolished earlier this year. And Mrs. Mundell lodged a petition in exactly the same terms in 2009. Now, I know there's sympathy for the Mendel's position, and for that reason, the committee has considered the issues raised and sought views, and I've heard from both David Stewart and, and Jimmy McGregor. That is why we wrote to the Scottish Human Rights Commission again in February. However, the commission told us that, as you had not changed whilst uh, writing previously in 2010. The position is still that in a case of dispute such as we have here, it is for the courts to consider and rule on whether Scottish ministers have breached human rights. This committee is not a court of law and we cannot provide such a ruling. Uh, at our last meeting, we agreed to seek the Rural Affairs Committee's views on the issues and raised in the petition to ask whether it would be willing to consider them in the context of any future work. That committee has now responded to us 
its letter states very clearly that as a ring fencing decision taken was a democratic one, it will not be looking uh, into it. It repeats that only the, that the only body that could provide the ruling that Mrs Mandel seeks would be a court. In these circumstances, it is my view that as a committee, we have now gone as far as we can with this petition. We need to be careful that we do not create unrealistic expectations here. And the reality, as far as I can see, uh, there is nothing more that the Public Petitions Committee can do, and I would be grateful to hear from other members' viewers, views, but I am very much minded to close this petition. Angus? Yes, yeah, thanks, um, Camina. This has clearly been an ongoing issue for, for some time, uh, and as I've stated previously, I, I, I certainly understand the frustration of the, the petitioners. Um, as a member of the Iraqi committee and, and having listened to the views of other members on that committee and, and taken on board the letter from Iraqi to the PPC committee uh, recommending closure of the, of the petition, uh, I feel uh, I'm in agreement with you, convener, that, um, that the commi this committee has no option uh, but to close it. It's, it's regrettable that uh, uh, no further action can be taken at this level. Uh, however, it has been reiterated um, uh, that only a court can rule on whether or not human rights have been breached, and the petit petitioners have been advised of that um, on, on numerous occasions. So whilst having sympathy with uh, the, 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 the predicament um, that uh, the petitioners find themselves in, um, I, I don't see that there's any more that this committee can do um, to, to, uh, to help. And um, clearly the advice uh, that only a court can rule is, uh, is a salient point. Anzala. Uh, thank you, convener. And, um, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, I feel the petitioners have been, been failed in uh, the support from the government because they've come to this petition time and time again and they have stressed that they don't have the means by which they can challenge the government on this issue. And I, I feel that somehow we've, we've let them down because it is a fact of life that unless they had large sums of monies, they were not going to be able to defend themselves. So they were up against the wall from day one. And the fact that we have not found a solution for them is disappointing. Um, I still feel that they've been let down. I still feel that somehow, somewhere, there would have been a mechanism where a citizen of this country's rights would have been protected better. Uh, we have clearly failed them. Uh, I feel quite sad that we, are, we may take this decision today. I would, have, I would have felt more comfortable if there was a solution found where their rights could have been protected and they could have been they could have had a, a fair hearing in another place to uh, pursue their 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 human rights and, and I think we've left them there sorry to say that convener but I feel we, we just haven't been able to reach out and support them in the way that I would have liked to have seen them supported Jackson I, I have some sympathy with the position Hanzala Malik um, details uh, when Dave Stewart and uh, Jamie McGregor at our last uh, consideration of this petition suggested the possibility of an inquiry, um, I thought that was worth pursuing. Uh, I think the letter we've received from the Rural Affairs Committee is not an encouraging one in that regard. And I think the point Angus ultimately makes, which is that we cannot adjudicate on a legal matter means that whilst our inquiry may well, if we were to initiate it, shed light on something, it in itself could not bring about the resolution of the issue, uh, which is beyond our competence. And I am concerned that in those circumstances, the balance of whether or not we should do that uh, isn't proven. And, and so I'm a little bit like Hanzala Malik, not satisfied that Mr. and Mrs. Mundell's position has been resolved in any way by this committee, but I'm not sure that this committee can. 
Any other questions? So, if there are no further questions, can I uh, ask members what action you would like to take in this petition? Members agree to close the petition? Yep. Okay. So the committee, uh, so the, sorry, the, the, the petition is now closed on the basis that the, the, the petition to ring fence was democratically made and the petitioner's claims and allegations can only be determined in court. Everybody agreed? Agreed. Okay. We will now move to the next petition. The next petition is PE1, Treble 5, by Siobhan Garricky on the electric shock vibration collars for animals. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? I think it might be premature to do anything. I mean, I'm at a loss to see, you know, there is a suggestion here about getting further information, but, I mean, it doesn't seem to me anything that we would necessarily wish to make an inquiry into. Unless the RACI committee or something like that had a view, it does seem to me that we're kind of reaching the end of a road as to where we go with it. Uh, the issue's been raised. You know, nobody's running to make any decision one way or other. And it seems to me we either just leave it and see where things go or, you know, uh, or you you close it almost because I, I, I can't see any any ongoing inquiry by us would be of any substance. I mean, my own personal view is that, uh, that, that I believe shock collars are uh, shock collars are cruel and, and no, certainly can't be justified. But and having said that, I'm not opposed to the vibration devices being used as, as appropriate circumstances. Would it be then be possible if the committee uh, before closing that we would uh, perhaps uh, DEFRA are doing a, a second study uh, has been cited both those in favour of a ban e calls and those against so an option for the committee would, could be to seek the views of the authors of the study at the University of Lincoln on what the petition calls for and you can maybe bring it back Jackson um, I'm, I'm struck by the, the penultimate paragraph of the cabinet secretary's letter to us um, and I think to close the petition now might be a bit premature. The previous ban, therefore, was that there was insufficient objective evidence in support of a ban. However, after considering the points made in the debate in January, I share the strong concerns expressed regarding the potential for misuse of these devices, and I have asked for further information on the use of electronic collars in Scotland and other countries and the basis for the ban in Wales. Officials are currently in the process of gathering this information and have had discussions with animal welfare organisations, the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association and animal behaviourists. And I think given that the Cabinet Secretary has decided to take an interest in the matter, um, we might be advised at least to wait until he's able to update us on what he thinks the outcome of that consideration has been. John Wilson. Convener, I was going to make the same suggestion because clearly the response we got from the Welsh Assembly said that they had currently they've had the ban in place currently about to review the ban and it may be worthwhile waiting till we see or get a date from them when they expect the review to be completed so that we can actually then further look at it. Because if you look at the written responses we've had to date, uh, we've had you know, a number of responses opposed to continued use of those uh, callers. Uh, one in favour, interestingly, from the, the manufacturers uh, the, of the electronic or, uh, callers and we've actually, you know, the, even the NFU Scotland are splitting the issue. They, they don't want to come down on either side of the issue at the present moment. So I think by holding off in terms of the suggestion that uh, Kenny McCaskill's made and others about looking at what the Scottish Government intend to do on this issue, but also ask the Welsh Assembly when they expect to have the review completed, uh, which might help to inform us uh, to take either to close this petition or take forward this petition at a later date. Members agree then that we wait to the Scottish Government in response to the further information and from the Welsh Assembly who are doing the review and see what the outcome from that is. And could we also maybe, uh, as I advised earlier there, that we may want to go back to the University of Lincoln uh, to ask what the petition calls for? 
Ja? Great. Great? Okay. The next petition is PE1556 by John Mayhew on behalf of the Scottish Campaign for National Parks and the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland on a National Park Strategy for Scotland. Members of a note by the, by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite contribution from members? Angus. Yes, thanks, Convener. I think it's uh, disappointing that we haven't had word from the, the Scottish Government yet um, to the letter sent on the 29th of April. However, it may be a case that no news is good news, and they're, they're considering um, the, the, the points uh, studiously. Um, that said, it is disappointing that they haven't responded to date. <coughs> Any other questions? Jackson, Jackson sorry. I'll have a glass of whatever Angus is on. <laughs> <laughs> obviously breeds optimism. Um, I think in the very first instance, I mean, there is a suggestion that we hear from, uh, we organ contact some other organisations. I think in the first instance, what I really want to hear is the Scottish Government's response to uh, our original letter. Um, it may well be that leads to further information being sought, but uh, you know, I don't necessarily want to initiate that before we've had that response. And I think we should write saying, they were slightly disappointed that we weren't able to have that response before the summer recess and that, therefore, it's going to be some time before we can return to the issue. And had they replied timidly, that would have been to, uh, I think, our, our benefit and the petitioner's advantage. Members agree, then, that we write to Scottish Government? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. The final continued petition today is PE1562 by Al McLean on perverse acquittal. And members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? I, mean, I think the petition should be closed. I think, uh, as we all, I think, uh, recognised uh, that there's a great deal of sympathy for Mr McLean, but uh, I think, as we see from the Sheriff's Association, to change the position that we're at would be a fundamental change in the law of Scotland. I can't see any merit in writing about asking about the number of times sheriffs have sent it back. I have to say in 20 years practice, I was never aware of it happening. I have to say as seven and a half years as Justice Secretary, I was never aware of it happening. I think the likelihood you'll find is it's hardly ever been done. I think it comes back to the point made by the Sheriff's Association. You'd be asking one person, the sheriff or judge, uh, to replace a verdict of 15. I think it's something that we just have to leave until such time as the government, parliament, members' bills wish to change it, or the Bonnemi report moves things further. But I think we've gone as far as we can, and with no desire for legislative change, anything else would, would, uh, would simply run into the sand. Any other questions? Do members agree then with, with Ms McCaskill's proposal? Close the petition. Thank you. As there are no further business, uh, I now formally close the meeting. <laughs>